Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back. Before I get into the ad read for today, something pretty big is coming up for the coffee shop. Black Rifle Coffee Kalispell is about to have their one-year anniversary. On the 25th of February, this comes out on Monday, two-plus weeks from now, and it's going to be pretty cool. We're going to do free drip coffee for anybody who wants to come in the store Saturday or Sunday. Sunday is actually the 25th. Sunday, we're going to be doing a bunch of giveaways as well. Some brands have really stepped up and pitched in. Everything from Vortex, giving away some variable power scopes and a red dot, uh, pistol sight, t-shirts and hats. Maybe Montana Knife Company has a blade that they're going to give us. Cloud defensive flashlights. Yeah, they're going to be there giving away some stuff. Gator sunglasses, my all-time favorites, which of course, in the moment right now that I don't have one in front of me, I would hold it up and show you, but they're all going to be there. So swing by Kalispell on the weekend of the 24th and the 25th. The big stuff's going down on the 25th. Who makes this episode possible, this entire podcast? That's right. It's Black Rifle Coffee. We're going to keep this one short because I just talked about the coffee shop. First thing I'm looking at is the coffee club. You can get 20% off when you start a subscription using the code COFFEE20. Get what you want delivered where you want it on the frequency that you want. What else do they have? Oh, little Fit Fuel action. Shake, sip, and repeat. Looks like it comes with or doesn't come with, but there are new tumblers that you could get associated with that. And Green Team, this is one of their ECS roasts, which is the Evan Evans Coffee subscription. I think that's what it stands for. Who knows what it stands for? These show up every month. Oh, it says exclusive coffee subscription. That's nowhere near as fun. It's Evans Coffee subscription. They show up every month. It's different every month, and Evan is the one who selects the roast. And each of them have tasting notes on the back, as well as the best brewing tips and techniques. Let's scroll down here a bit. Standard coffee bar that goes from light to dark. And to keep it quick, the apparel gear, coffee bundle, and coffee samplers. And at the bottom is the best sellers. AK is delightful. Just Black is good. You know, they're all good. Freedom Roast and Freedom Fuel Roast. So if you're looking for coffee, if you have a coffee lover in your life, a birthday coming up, a special occasion, I don't know if I'd say Valentine's Day, but why not? Get you some. Go to blackriflecoffee.com. That's it. Let's talk about my guests today. That's right, plural. It was going to be one, but it's two. William Yeski and Nick R. Mendares. Mr. Yeski is the author of this book, Damn the Valley. It's about 1st Platoon, Bravo Company, 2nd of the 508th, Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne, and their time in the Arkandab River Valley, Afghanistan, specifically late 2009 through 2010. Nick was there with him. Um, We get into exactly what the book is and their experiences um, and how both Will and Nick tie into the story. And one of the things I really like and enjoy about the book is it tells these stories not just through Will's lens, but through the lens of different people that were there experiencing the same thing. Because if you have a half a dozen people in experiences like this, you're going to have a half a dozen stories and a half a dozen truths. And they're all legitimate to the person that is repeating it or retelling that story. So I think it's great to observe something through a variety of different angles. And it is important to me that these stories are never forgotten because they suck and they're ugly and they're hard to talk about. We're talking about people getting torn to pieces. We're talking about the entire prosthetic wing in the Walter Reed Memorial Hospital being full of people from Will and Nick's element at one point in time in 2010. And they should never be forgotten. And I wish that policymakers and people that commit American human capital into foreign wars had to suffer through stories like this every single day that they are making decisions like that. So let's get into this. Episode number 233 with Will William Yeski and Nick Armendares. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute, give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Where do you guys want to start? Oof. I mean, we can just... Hmm. 
I mean, this can go from anywhere. There's so many different aspects from this. There's thing. no wrong direction, and that's why I kind of leave it to you know. You guys are the ones who put the time in and traveled up here, and I mean, you can start it with like, uh, how did all this come about? You could start it with that. I don't mind talking about the background, like my background, but I know that people are more or less wanting to hear more about these, these stories. Yeah. That end. There is a big historical aspect to this whole thing mm -hmm. to where this is nonfiction. Uh, I went through the DOD process. How was that? <laughs> Believe it or not, painless. The guy that I got who was uh, like- How much time did oh it take? God. Initial manuscript, two weeks. Really? Yes. Congratulations to you, sir. I mean, it, well, it was, so 60,000 words. Um, okay. Is that what's in the book? Sixty thousand? No, hell no, 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 no. no. Uh, How many words are in the book? I think we're at like a hundred and five. Okay, I mean, I'm asked for my own curiosity. You never know the thickness of a book. Yeah, well, and they they. It's strange because the word count is actually right around what you would get with a bigger book, a thicker book. And I'm like, why is this one so thin? It's the way they typeset it. That makes sense. Yeah, which I'm a little bit like. Eh. You know, just because of it looks a little thin and people are like, hmm, what I am I getting? Looks thin. Uh, to me, if you pick it up, it's a very, and I don't say it negatively, average size book. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> I mean, you took it to that place, not me. That's not what I was talking about. But if you want to go there, we can go there. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, like, so that wasn't, there's been so many different instances with this to where there's been resonance. So like the guy that I got a hold of that picked up the um, that was the reviewer mm -hmm. was former infantry, loved the story right off the bat. Um, he cleared it in three months, and then it still seems pretty quick. It was super quick, like that was crazy fast. Yeah. Like that's unheard of. Um, and then I came back and then did once we had everything together, and it only took like three weeks after that. It's not bad. No. No, the publisher, I'm so glad I did it on my own uh, on that end because the publisher didn't even, you know, they're like, oh, don't worry about the process. Even my old CEO was like, eh, we didn't see that much. Well, you shouldn't have any problems. Um, and then sure enough, things came back that were all blacked out. So we had like task force in and out. Um, There's some ODAs out there as well. And there was. It's very bizarre given the fact that none of that is really sensitive. A lot of this stuff too, like uh, the DAPS platform. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we can even talk about that. There's a chapter of retribution in there to where um, this was combined with, you know, they had A10s on station. Yeah. They had the DAPS platform come in and freaking pff, fuck these guys up. Yeah, DAPS are amazing. Oh my God. Sick. But you weren't allowed to write about them? They blacked that stuff out. They blacked out little birds. Uh, and then they even blacked, like, let's, let's show how dumb <laughs> this is, Michael. Please put into Google DAPS, D A P S. And maybe like uh, UH-60. Yeah. And then let's see what images come up. But I think the reason why they did that and why, so our old CEO, I asked him to, why would they do that? And he's like, because yeah. there's only one setup that- Oh, hmm. Yeah. Super secret. Right? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right there. But they're like, there's only one sixty that flies that. So like you can kind yeah. of start playing. I'm like, okay, so. I mean, fortunately, they, they don't have a lot of stuff that they need to strip off the internet. It should be really easy for them to get rid of that. The fuck? I know. It's... Oh, look, it, it exists on a, a video game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Oh, some guys got in trouble for that a little while ago, though, didn't they? Uh, I what mean, was, what, which yeah, one? that was a little bit of a different issue. That was active duty people participating in the production of a video game. Yeah. The issue with that is, is they couldn't go, I don't want to get too deep into it because I'm not, intimately familiar, but essentially they wanted to go after the author of a book, but they couldn't, but they realized he was the program manager for that particular video game <laughs> and in an indirect manner. Where can we take him down? Yeah. They didn't take him down. They just nuked about a half a dozen people's career that <sighs> were associated with that. It's ridiculous. Some of them should have known a little bit better. Um, you yeah. know, there's things you can do and can't do when you're on active duty. As you know, you can moonlight a little bit. It helps if you have uh, permission of your chain of command. I didn't always, as most people probably don't always. And I'm, I mean, maybe I got lucky, but well, I also never did. If you look at actually what they were doing and what they told, what they were told they were doing, it wasn't uh, career ending worthy by any stretch of the imagination. But it was an environment mm. where the military was out for blood, yeah, and they were going to get somebody's. And those people were easily accessible and still under the purview of the DOD, whereas the person who had gotten out and written the book, I mean, what are they going to do to him? Eventually, they did a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he wrote a very large check back to the government, I believe. <laughs>
Well, we've 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 seen uh, we've had our fair share of seeing how this goes down. Um, that was actually part of with this is like leaving a bunch out uh, to where I didn't want that portion to overshadow what the guys had done. How do you think that impacts the story, though? Because it's an interesting argument. How much, you know, okay, let's use the daps as an example. Okay. You can go on YouTube and watch gun runs from AH6s and daps Eh. in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's not like it's a covered program. And if you pull that stuff out, are you painting as accurate of a picture as possible? Like, at what point does it actually detract from what you are trying to leave as a legacy of what has happened in that valley, not only to the U.S., but to Russia and basically oh, yeah. since the history of time. Yep. Like, where's the line there, you know? Yeah. Because it does change the story. It does. It does. There was there was portions in there and, like, where I looked at it, where they had blacked out and I said, okay, like, how, how can I keep it to where yeah. you're feeling that sense of, like, holy shit. Or how like, about just telling the truth? Hey. You know? Hey. <laughs> well, that, that's where some of this, I mean, I more recently... Uh, within the last two weeks, you know, got my first threat. Did you? Oh, yeah. It could be because you're wearing a fucking Mickey Mouse hat. <laughs> hey, I was wondering if you were going to come out with that. Uh, yeah. It is. You know what? This hat is not so much. And I almost grabbed another one from over at your shop just because I was like, you know what? Because mm, you wanna didn't be... want to look like you were a Mickey Mouse fan? <laughs> it's more about the memories. I mean, it's probably one of the best vacations the I've ever had. Oh, stop it. No, I'm serious. Are you serious? No, I... The relationship with the kids, I know what you're talking about. The, the, the happiest place on earth is yeah, the really not. You have so many screaming freaking parents. Yeah. I don't have that relationship with my kids. They're... Pull that mic closer to you. If you're going to move back and forth, it has to come with you. All right, uh-huh. we're going to play a game of chase the microphone. Boom. Yeah. Okay. You need to take more vacations. I do. Did That's... you buy that at Disney? Yeah. Okay, so it's a $96 hat. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about breaking the bank? Take a family of four or five to Disneyland or Disney World. Stand by. That was, I keep telling the wife, like, hey, let's go somewhere overseas. Let's go. You know, you don't need to, you just blow it all in one pot right there. Yeah. yeah. So of all the hats you had, you thought that the uh, Mickey Mouse one was the one to lead with? <laughs> it's my favorite hat. It just is. Why? It just, I think it's tied to the memories of it. It really is. It I would create probably... a mantle for it at your house and then never wear it outside. Ooh. I That's mean, is, I is that like a MAGA hat? Uh, I guess. I mean, people can wear whatever they want. You know, that's, that's interesting. Is it a bad idea to make America great again? Has America ever been great? Mm. You know, because are we, I mean, as a, as a concept, putting America first as Americans and really focusing on what's happening inside of our borders as opposed to exclusively outside, I think it's a great idea. I actually, I think it sucks that that particular phrasing has been weaponized. I agree. Yeah. No, no, 100%. I think what makes America great, though, is our, I mean, our ability to look out for other people, too. I mean, we got to look out for ourselves, yeah. you know, but the fact that we're out there trying to do some good outside our borders as well. We're also out there trying to do some pretty fucked up shit. I mean, let's not pretend like we are altruistic as a nation. No. Uh, I mean, though, from on the ground perspective, you know, there, there is, you might get sent in to do something or somewhere, but you're still in that situation. You're still doing the right thing. I think... Right or wrong, you know, I don't know if actually the person on the ground even has the opportunity to make that choice. They just do the best that they can. Yeah. Like for me, I don't, I mean, I can't speak for you guys, but I never, I was never morally questioning what I was doing. Uh, am I, am I on the side of justice? Like, I really hope we get through this. Yeah. And everybody comes back with all their fingers, toes, you know, life, limit, eyesight. Let's hope we all have those things. I wasn't thinking about the greater purpose or I am now protecting people's First Amendment rights. No. Like let's let's get through tonight. <laughs> yeah, the best you That's, can with the information you have on hand, you know. And yeah, try it's to something make it that I, the it's something that I think is lost. Well, I don't know. Maybe they just don't think about it. I don't think it's necessarily lost. But the people who have the most proximal view to what the foreign policy of the United States looks like from the DoD have the, probably the least to do with the direction that they're pointed, and they're tasked with doing some horrendous things. Sometimes some very common people tasked with doing very uncommon things and they do the best they can but they don't wear mickey mouse hats when they do it <laughs> you know ah, killing me <laughs> killing me where's it where's their Hold spare on. hat where's I'm, the spare hat around I'm here killing you you wore that fucking thing all right <laughs> it's all right i remember when i was 12 too what would you like to talk about <laughs> damn so now <laughs> got him <'em. laughs> uh 
So you're in the process of writing the book, 105,000 pages. The book comes out. Where do, you, where do you want to take it from here? I mean, obviously, I want to talk about what what happened in the book. And like I said, I'm about a third of the way through it. I'm mean, actually, I just, this morning I was reading about uh, the initial IED where the guy got, sounds like he Johnston. Got, yeah. I got thrown off the top of the wall. It sounds like. Yeah. He was like directly over the charge. So it was buried in the wall, probably like torso height or something like that. So it would have just nuked everybody. So there's two, there was oh. an, an initiator. So like the footpath that we we're coming in on mm -hmm. to toe popper. I mean, we literally had gone over it with a mine hound. Probably low metal, though, like you said. Yeah. I yeah. mean, just the size of a pin, you know? That's and all there is. And then to add into that, there's a lot of ferrous metals in the ground right. in some of those areas. So, yeah, that's yep. it's easy to underestimate your enemy. Whew. Like, oh, we are centuries ahead from technology. And then they create a charge, mm -hmm. like you said, debt court, no, like, you know, no metal. Dumb. There's going to be a blasting cap in there somewhere, but I suspect, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen somebody mine sweep a wall where the actual charge was sitting as started to, I mean, you're going to have to, right? Because yeah. why'd they put it there in the first place? And it was interesting in the way you described it. There was some MRE trash that was in there. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. we're not the only people who do AARs. Yep. So they saw that it had been used by Americans. You can sit there and watch and see how they enter and where they go. And yeah, well, it was the second. So as we were, as we came in, you know, I go down this way mm -hmm. You know, I'm setting up the radio. And that was the other thing, too, is you had to put a long whip up or you wouldn't reach out. And, I mean, these aren't huge distances, but, again, we were talking Three about Three feet mud models. walls yep. really suck for UHF and VHF comms. <laughs> and one after another right after on. another. Like that picture on the back here yeah. to where these guys are – that's standard. It is. Compound yeah. to compound to compound. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, he knows. Holy crap. Yeah, the and only way walls. you can beat that is – that whip or actually getting up on a, on a roof where you have line of sight yeah, or SATCOM if you have the right angle. Yeah. But to, at that point in time, um, the technology for SATCOM, like, I mean, you're talking about a few minutes and setting up the can and everything else. Oh, you guys didn't have the sexy handhelds. <laughs> yeah, Listen uh, here. Listen somebody here. else took all those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We would just, what are you talking about? You just hook it right to your radio and hold it up there. I mean, Ugh. that's fine. Not that I did. Uh, not that I had those. I mean, there's some people I know do. <laughs> there's those black lines again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, fuck. Yeah. It, it. I was reading that. Um. God, what a horrendous experience, man. To be, to have them bury it in the wall, and somebody's climbing over the wall and clacks it. You're not going to survive that. I'm surprised he was alive when he hit the ground. We all, we were too. I, I mean, just, how, like it was up and I mean, it was he was hollowed out. And it's, I'm that, like, what is left? That sounds like movie prop type shit. <sighs> yeah. I mean, that's when I got out there, I was not expecting you yeah. know, what I saw because he's screaming. So you're like, okay. You know, but then when you come up to that, you're like, how, how does a human survive? Or like, what is still pushing him? How is he, you know, doc, have you even shot him up with morphine yet? Yeah. And he hadn't yet at that point. He was just stuffing him full of curl X. I mean, he's just going, going at it. And you had Even to, though he knew and, it was, and the dog had to know, right? Like he knew, yeah. he knew immediately. But what else are you going to do? Sit there and yeah. hold somebody's hand and be like, "Hey, man, just maybe go towards the light. Don't fight it." Those are the famous last words that you want to hear, right? Like, "Am I going to be okay?" Yeah, just don't fight it. Drift off. I'm like, "What yeah. are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to provide the best care humanly possible." And the guy like is asking, "Hey, do I still have my balls?" You're like, "Yep." Yeah. Even though they don't. Am I going to die? Nope. You're going to be okay. I mean, what the fuck else are you going to do? Yeah. That was one of the biggest things with me is like after that had happened and that was the first time. And I, you know, I kind of go back and I'm just like, man, like what, what could you have done better? You know, you're, you sound like an idiot, like with what you were talking to him about and everything, just because I was saying the first thing going through my head. What else could you possibly have done? You know, I, I mean... Just been there in a different way, I think. I don't think so, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would be the worst case scenario? You're on that wall. He probably didn't realize that the IED had clacked off. In my experience, they're so injured, they don't really remember why or the mechanism, you know? Yeah. Because they're, they're, what would be the best way to describe it? They're walking dead, even though they're not walking. Yeah. Like, you kind of come up on the scene, you're like, fuck, right? I think just being there i mean what would be the worst case scenario i would say having that happen and you fade off into nothing by yourself that would suck i think anything beyond that yeah. is all anybody could ask for yeah yeah 
It's tough to think about, right? No, I know. And that's even like, so hearing that, and that's why I put um, the other guy in there too. My, my end of like what had happened on there, I actually explained in another book that's out there Mm -hmm. that I interviewed for. So like when this one came along, I'm like, this is the chance to take it from Will Ross's perspective and really put it out from his perspective out there on what had happened. But he wasn't the only one who, you know, had been in an IED incident and then had that like talking me through it like it was almost like his brain was rebooting afterwards the closer you are to those things i think the the shadier the memory becomes it gets a little frayed even just from the concussive blast like there's probably a zero percent chance that all of you didn't have concussions <laughs> well that where that was set up and how it was set up that was meant well, to was take it, out a squad were they mines what was the actual charge did they ever figure out what the explosive was in the yeah, wall that was a jug it was a jug so it was hme homemade explosive yes. yeah okay Daddy, it was big. Yeah, it was big. You were mm. were you at the con? Were you at where? Yeah, so we came out, I believe, for uh, QRF. Uh, Stands for shortly. quick reaction force. Here's one mistake that I commonly make. We are about to digress into shit that nobody's going to understand if we use acronyms. So we got to do the best we can to break <laughs> gotcha. them. Down. Quick reaction force, which for people listening is exactly what you think. If something happened, they are quick to react and they are a force. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, we, we had gotten there shortly, you know, after you guys had gone through everything. And uh, coming up on the scene, I think we had got there to uh, post our outer security while you guys were operating and doing all that you could. And then I believe that's when the birds came in and everything. Yeah. Well, you guys got there after – I know the first guys that got out there were – so this is all First Platoon's view. So if you're breaking it down, we're mm-hmm. – you know, you have three platoons. They're on QRF. First platoon's operating out there, doing um, you know doing this particular operation, and some of the guys from first just threw their stuff on, jumped in with it, but then ran, like ran through minefields to get. Like afterwards, they're like, "I can't believe I just did that." I was just gonna say, I understand their intent, but they Whoa. actually could have made it substantially worse by becoming a mass casualty incident. Exactly way worse like afterwards then and they were breaking everything down there why in the hell did i do that yeah because the first guy to cross that wall was bobby muscle um so our muscle was just jumping over you know it was almost like the i remember him coming up on it you know and him coming up as myself uh will ross and doc ponce were working on johnston and that's like right when he started to fade out yeah and he came up and he just started he punching things he was pissed which is also not good. No. The new environment. Cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's no there's no clean or precise way to deal with those situations. You know, there's no perfect reaction. I understand, you know, from him losing his cool to the people throwing their shit on and running headlong towards the sound of their friends who are in trouble. Like, I get that. But not always the best approach. Well, and then you even have that other kid that was there that... He doesn't even remember that, mm. you know, what I took down and him just literally going into a, he, he sees Johnston and he sees like the carnage, everything that happened in front of him. He goes white and then he just starts shaking. Just shock. And it wasn't, but it wasn't him, you know I mean? And he bore down on the Afghan police that were with us just cause they were Brown. Yeah. You know, and screaming and here it is where I'm having to grab his muzzle and bring it down. That is truly classic shock. <sighs> yeah. 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 How do you train for that? Can't, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can go through so many reps. Be a hell of a weird, uh, like training scenario back home. I mean, they do the best they can with the live tissue training. Uh, and we used to use that stuff all the time and they would introduce it into the middle of even administrative stuff. You'd be having something going on with like the command staff and they would introduce a medical scenario outside mm. or we'd be working through complex, like, Helicopter assault with a vehicle assault, like sandwiching a top and bottom of a building or a compound, and you go into a room, and then there's the doc, and there's the goat or the pig, and they're like, okay, yeah. sling them up, boys, and like, oh, shit, like switching gears, and then back out to the clearance problem, and everybody else is involved in the clearance problem, and they're you know talking to you, and you're – we used to do that stuff all the time, but, I mean, it's not the same. No. Yeah. Especially it's when it's same. somebody who you've yeah. trained with and been up with and you know through there. You know, I know things about them, you know, yeah. and operate alongside of them. How early into your, if I'm assuming it was a 12 monther you guys were doing over there? Yes. How early into that did that happen with that first ID strike? So it was kind of weird because of we weren't originally in the Argonaut River Valley. 
uh, we ended up in the beginning, we came into Kandahar and then they threw us out in Helmand province. Michael, will you pull up a image of Afghanistan so we can kind of talk people yeah. into where we're, uh, the geography here. Yeah, I've spent, I did multiple rotations over there and sometimes I even get lost in the geography of some of it. So oh, yeah, it's nuts. Well, this is the beauty of having the ability to, you know, look at something. It is. A, yeah. It's nice when you have somebody that can do that. Yeah. <laughs> he's not <laughs> good for bring much. It up, bring know, it up. He's good for this. <laughs> Yeah, so we, I mean, we originally got put in Helmand province, and it was a, quite honestly, when we showed up to Afghanistan, it was a good idea ferry. Yeah. You know. Um, All right. They didn't have a spot for us. Let's zoom it in a touch, Michael. Kandahar down south. There you go. And Lashkar Gah was where we were. Yep. Yep. So west, Lashkar Gah. And I mean, it was that green, let's call it uh, northeast to southwest running, that's the... That's the valley. ARV. Yep. You can see, obviously, there's a uh, water source likely causing all of that to uh, actually be the color green as opposed to the color sand around it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the thing is Lash was so that desert type environment. And it was like what you read about in every conventional type mm -hmm. deployment. A lot of just hurry up and wait, a lot of sitting around. There's so much standoff between you and an enemy. Um, not too worried about it, you know, on that aspect. But then you get up into the mountains and the orchards in the Argonob, complete different fighting space. Yeah. Uh, and so think, it wasn't early then. So you started off in Helmand doing something completely different. Yeah. There was uh, four months or so where we were just up and down the highway doing side by side training missions with Afghan police. It was boring. The uh, Afghan National Civil Order Police that we were there and basically just doing. Um, yeah, as as far as their uh, combat advisors and and that regard, and so we were hanging out at the ANCOP, the Afghan National Civil Order Police Compound, and we were essentially training them, uh, uh, doing you know small street level tactics uh, along those lines, and you know trying to stabilize that area. And then four months in, hey guys, well, grab your shit. They were trying to get us into Marja, <laughs> so okay. like our battalion commander was like. He was itching. You know, I've got all these guys who trained up for Iraq, you know, because that's originally where we were headed. And it was supposed to be an urban door-to-door -door fight. And yeah. switched to Afghanistan. Oh, what are we doing out here? You know, executive orders were signed because of the Kandahar surge. But they just needed, yep, you're the next ones to go, so send them. Um, so we just found ourselves doing stuff that wasn't what we were trained for. And then I'm going to assume you essentially, even though it may not have been overnight, it probably felt like it. Once, as soon as you got there, the mission set completely different from what you were doing previously. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, so we were operating, the Brits were in that area, and the Marines. They never, they didn't want us doing anything really with them. They were like, eh, a bunch of paras, a bunch of cowboys, you know, it's going to pop off. How accurate is that assessment of the paras? <sighs> I mean, Are you cowboys? guys cowboys? Like, yeah, Absolutely. Did you guys ever have dress uniforms that had like spurs and stuff? Because I have seen. Have you guys ever seen? Oh, no, that's not us. No, God not. no. So I think the cavalry guys in the army, some of their dress uniforms, I think, first off, they do have a bitch and hat. Let's be honest. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Yeah. I swear to God, though, I've seen somebody in a dress uniform with spurs, but it yes. might have been it might have been a Brit soldier. So huh. cavalry units within yeah. the army, they do get sport, spurs. They can do like a spur ride or something yeah. along those lines. Yep. And essentially when they do a combat deployment, they their spurs. depends on the color spurs I get, I believe. They either have brass or silver and all sorts of all sorts <laughs> they of. They get flair. weird about it. I mean, it's pretty cool, though. It is. So the, I can see calling them cowboys. Where did the uh, you know where did the pairs get their uh, reputation for being off the uh, off the hinge a little bit? It's just that aggro. I mean, who else teaches LGOPs, little groups of paratroopers? So you have these. You have to think about you're dropping in. Yeah, it's going to be mass chaos because nobody ever drops in the right areas anyway. Historically, that is accurate. So, a group of guys getting together and like, hey, let's go fuck shit up. Let's go move to the sound of the guns. Not many people. You know, it's very it's well, terrifying when you think about it. And well, and typically, if you do have you know these little groups are dropped off, you've got you know Bravo Company who maybe uh, dropped in the wrong area with Charlie Company, and everybody has to focus on that same mission and understand you know the the bigger picture, so that when you get down, it's more of a, a lethal force, and it's and it's ingrained in us down to that bottom level of you know even that private should know the bigger picture, so that when you are lost, you can circle up with some other guys figure out what you need to do to accomplish the overall mission and stuff. So I think in that, <clears throat> excuse me, in that regard, I do think, you know, when it gets to like paratroopers and everything like that, we do hold ourselves of like high regard and, you know, then 
than some others. You know, maybe that's me being an elitist, but what others? Uh, Don't like you know, mention just, names, uh, but be specific. Uh, hey, here you go. This one's all you, buddy. <laughs> this one's all you. I'll just pass that one off over. There. I mean, I need the army guys to talk shit about the other army guys because I'm, no, I'm over my skis. 100%. I don't know that much about them. Yeah, so, so we just, uh, you know, we're off on our own little island of of happiness and other paratroopers where we like to be, and uh, just you know, march to the sound of gunfire, like he said. Is the training, I mean, other than the airborne course, which actually all three of us at this table have gone through at Benning, um, which could be condensed into, I think, about 16 hours. Yeah. But you're not wrong. <laughs> for the difference between a dirty, nasty leg and an airborne soldier, like, what is the training difference in that other than the jump qualification? I think the value actually comes from the fact of you're doing something unnatural. You know, you're jumping out of a plane, yeah. you're doing something that you wouldn't normally do. You're facing that fear, but you have those adrenaline spikes to where you're really essentially teaching your body how to deal with cortisol spikes, you know? You're at least exposing it. Yeah. You know, I don't, you know, it's, it's been a long time since I've been out to Benning. I don't think they taught you how to deal with shit. No, but I mean, Other than just to like little... PLF to the left, PLF to the rear <laughs> yeah. quarter left, PLF. I'm like, oh my god! Yeah. I Graceful laugh because I just called yeah. the, the. I'm still convinced falling. the swing landing trainer is actually oh, a terrible, torturous device oh, for the instructors man. to try to drop you or lower you at times where there's nothing you can do right, purely for their own entertainment because they're stuck there and they just let it go. Yeah, you're in that thing for like <laughs> what, maybe a couple minutes, and they're just there for hours. Like, oh yeah, check this out. Mm -hmm. Just whack, painful. But if you think about it. Unless they've changed the course, I don't remember the term cortisol being even used a single time. It's an exposure no. for sure. Yeah. I remember my first jump, I was in the dead middle of the stick, which I'm really thankful for. Yeah. I, because oh. when it started moving, I did not have a choice. Yep. Away we, we just go. go. Yep. The dude's sitting there, number one, when the door comes open after the JM checks, I've been like, oh boy. <laughs> for clarity, for people listening, they didn't have a choice either. <laughs> nope. You'd get the boot. You're getting the kicked boot out for or sure. Oh, for sure. You're going. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an exposure to that stress, but I just... You know, maybe they should add, well, add to the course, whatever you want to, but exposure to stress and cortisol is one thing. Teaching people about what you're experiencing in your body and how you're learning to adapt with it would be the next level of instruction, I think. See, and I honestly think that the soldiers these days are, they're more aware of that end. Probably. Really due to stuff like this. I mean, more long, long form education. I if I had heard the word cortisol, I mean, it. It was in my adult life for sure, but probably way, way late in the military. And if I'm being honest, I probably didn't understand what it was. I mean, I had a little bit of some of that. So, you know, you know a little bit about I have a racing background. Mm -hmm. So I had already been exposed to a lot of those same type of adrenaline spikes. And I recognized the correlation. Hey, this is what they're doing yeah. here. This is exactly they're just getting you used to that type of thing, that high adrenaline type, which is also why you'll find well, Fort Bragg always has that reset counter. How many days since the last incident? Has it ever made it into double digits? Mm, did we ever? I don't. I don't think I've ever seen that thing get up. <laughs> There's just a yeah, lot of young soldiers sure. passing through at that point. Yeah, and like post boot camp, a little bit less supervision, a little paycheck in your pocket. But that's why Fayetteville is just a. I mean, man, Vietnam. You yeah, know. <laughs> it's a unique place. It's cleaned up a lot since. Uh, when has it though? Hey, you know, and it, if it hasn't. It's got to be on the, the underbelly. But yeah. I, when I went back there for the book launch event at the uh, Airborne Museum, there um, I kind of went by all the old haunts. And I'm like, oh. Good for them, though. They're all gone. Yeah, they bulldozed it. It's probably good. for good. the best. Progress. Yeah. Good for them. All right. So you guys are the cowboys of the Army. It's nothing like a good inner service rivalry. I'm here for it. You know? Yeah. Okay. We're here to support that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can respect that. Yeah. All right. So you get into the ARV, your mission set changes. What kind of stuff are you guys getting into? Well, and this is also, you have to think, and I did this in the book, you read through the Helmand yeah. part where we had that, I mean, it was a perfect, it was a perfect ambush. I mean, it was just an L shape yep. right through. And to go from something where you're feeling invincible to the Argandab, to where that incident happens the day after Christmas. I mean, talk about a kick in the dick. Yeah. You know, and the type of person that Johnson was, he was somebody that, you know, you could talk to about anything. You know, he was just a good guy. He was there to listen to. He cared about everybody else. And then for that to happen to him, whew, that was rough. Well, he also wasn't the only person hurt. So you might have acted a few people out that day, right? Yeah. So, so you go out with 
your full team and you come back with less, what kind of impact did that have on your unit? I mean, that was, so that night, uh, you even just, you talk about, so they, we all came back in, you know, to stay overnight. They sent out another, uh, I think you guys were, I know somebody else from first stayed there. Did you guys go out there for that? I know you were, you reacted, but did you stay out there? No, we didn't stay out, out there. We went back. Okay. Cause so some first stayed out there with our platoon sergeant. Yeah, one of the portions of your book, a oh. guy thought he was on a tree stump all night, couldn't get comfortable, and it was yep. a part of the guy's leg. Morton. Yeah. That's rough. That is what really messed with him overall out of the whole thing. Oh, I bet. You know, he is like, I still remember that. And talking about that. Whew, yeah. You know, revisiting that again. Like, I, he was like, I'm going to need a little bit. And I'm like, dude, don't. Just and then didn't you find his shoe in the morning, too, with the foot in there? They came back in, and it was like the next orchard over. You know, they just, they found, uh, they saw an Oakley boot yeah. and that's what he was wearing. And they're like, wow, that's weird. And there was a foot still in it. And he was like, holy shit. I think that that aspect, I don't know if I've ever seen it portrayed accurately. Like the time required to go look for pieces. Yeah. To make sure that like the person who is going to obviously going to go through the pretty long process of getting back home. And I think they all go through Dover through the mortuary affairs. Yeah. But with Johnston, I mean, we're talking two different trips with two different bags, for lack of a better term. Yeah. That's fucking rough. And people out there, I mean, I've seen people climbing in trees to recover what could only best be described as like mauled and gelatinous pieces that have some type of a American clothing on it that they would recognize. And I don't know if the family would have ever known the difference or seen it. I hope that they didn't. I've seen some people do open casket funerals where mm. fuck, they should not have done that. I don't, I, I know there's sometimes a religious aspect to that, but like, does anybody need to actually be traumatized by that? It's so rough. But you see these people who are unwilling to leave until they've recovered every single piece, which yeah. I totally understand, but I don't know if I've ever seen it captured. And I, and I don't even know necessarily how you would because I, the heaviness of that, of finding pieces of your friend and making sure that those pieces may back with them as a whole, is, yeah. that's a tough one. Well, and that's even more later on. Uh, I was in the talk for, for this one later on, but because um, we were all separated the way that things were is we ended up, the area was so saturated to where the platoons ended up operating independently. Mm -hmm. We got pushed out to another, you know, the cop Johnston. He was back at cop Ware. Uh, and then second platoon ended up at Cop Brunkhorst, which is named after Staff Sergeant Scott Brunkhorst, which they ended up going through the fields, you know, having to walk through minefields looking for pieces of this guy. And that was just, I mean, literally some of them were pulling trash bags, yeah, you know, and putting pieces in their freaking side pocket. I don't know how that doesn't leave a mark on everybody involved in that. I was going to say, when you say there's things that, you know, how, how do you prepare for certain things? You know, how do you prepare for, you know, like you said, picking up, you know, pieces of, you know, your best friend and putting them in a bag, you know, a trash bag because you don't have anything else or, you know, the rest of your salt pack because that's all you got, putting them in your cargo pockets. And, you know, and all like you said, all you know is just it's this one piece that has a certain – you know, you, you can tell what it is or, you know, you, you know, tell you're picking what it up was. whether it was a hip or a shoulder, but all you know is it just yeah. looks like yeah. a ham hawk or what is this? And, you knew, yeah. you know what it used to be and it's, you have a hard time identifying what exactly. it is currently. Yeah. That's a rough one. Yeah. Okay. We're back in the ARV. You guys are, I mean, what was, what was the direct impact you noticed after that? I mean, and I ask because in my own experience, that's oftentimes people's first forced look at mortality yeah this um, you know kind of bulletproof especially if you you know you've been in some an ambush but you're like sweet we're in an l and just laying heat on people totally dominate it feels amazing like you're like we're the best we won then you're in a compound that decides to detonate on you you're now short people from your original head count you probably eventually make it back and how are people doing that night was rough I mean, because you knew, you know, I especially knew as the RTO, like, I'm going right back out the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew where we were going right back over there to help out with the battle drill assessment. And, you know, you have guys crying that were there yeah. and just breaking down. Um, but it's going to your priorities work. Make sure your shit's charged. 
make sure your rack is ready and go to sleep because tomorrow it's all over again. Yeah. It's tough. It was day after day after day. How did things continue for you guys uh, after that particular IED? Kind of walk me through that deployment. So crazy enough, after that particular IED, it was weird for me because uh, my mid-tour came up. And so a few days later, I'm on a bird back to Kandahar and then back to the States. So hmm. I think I spent New Year's Eve in uh, Kuwait. And the next day I was back stateside. And I didn't really have time to process it. Um, I know there was a week to where I was home. And then the second week I took and went to snowboard with my brother. You know, we went up to Killington and uh, I partied my ass off. You know, we ended up getting into a fight to where... You, know, you and your brother did? Yeah. Over what? It was st- it was the dumbest thing. It was because uh, I was smoking cigarettes at the time. Yep. And, you know, I was like, hey, man, you know, he's driving. And I'm like, stop by that store. I just need to, you know, re-up on my smokes. And he was like, he wouldn't stop. <laughs> and I'm like, what the? And I just went full bore on him, like knife hand and everything. I'm like, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, you know, and, um, you know, we kind of split up and he... Uh, you know, he went and did his own thing, and I freaking ended up at this uh, house with a bunch of New York investors, freaking savoring champagnes and freaking just going balls out. You know, they were loving war stories. And, um, you know, and then a week later, back home and back into the shit, you know. and Did you at least close the loop and reconnect with your brother before you left, or was that the last interaction you guys had? It wasn't like the last interaction. I mean, it was like a – but we didn't <laughs> – I know, I know. It was such a dick move too, because like you think you're well, going to Well, imagine it was this. the fucking last interaction you guys had. Could you imagine that? Imagine the <sighs> burden that he would have to carry because of that. Oof. That would yeah. suck. That would suck. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, like literally, um, so when I went back, I kind of like tactically, like I had a really short time layover in Atlanta. So I was like, I'm going to miss this flight. So Just I walked a one extra slow. day. Yeah. yeah. And I, of course I did. I missed the flight by, you know, oh, <sighs> Ramps closed. Sorry. Sucks. Went up to the USO, got a free room, stayed in Atlanta for the night. Um, and when I came back, it just was. It was that, like, levity of what am I going back to? Um, where can I get the best food I can here? And I ended up at, uh, you know, just the sushi thing in the airport. But, like, not airport sushi. It was, like, the international terminal. So, there's, okay. like, this, like, you're going to spend easily $100. We're talking in Atlanta? Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned it in there. And the weirdest part is that meal got paid for. By Grossman. By Grossman. Yeah. Um, or at least, you know, after I, and I touched base with him and he hasn't gotten back to me because I'm like, was that really you or was that just somebody? Because they knew, you know, and everything. And I said something. I didn't know who he was yeah. either. You know, I just said there was like some old guy who was a lieutenant colonel at some time, Grossman. And like the guys were like, do you know who the hell that was? Because he had gone and spoke to our unit. Yeah. Uh, before I was there, I guess it was for the previous deployment. And I had no idea, you know, like, you idiot. Freaking, and they hand me the book, and I'm like, holy shit. Like, he paid for my sushi? Like, god damn. Did you go to his uh, presentation, or was that before you got uh, That was right before I got okay. there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was because uh, I didn't know, you know, the next time I was getting a meal like that. How did you leave things with your brother, though? Honestly, I don't remember. I, I, I don't, I don't, th- I, I honestly got, I, I don't patch, I don't think I patched it up before I yeah. left. Do you I really think don't. that those, did you go on a mid tour uh, leave as well? Yeah, I did as well. So mine was uh, about the beginning of February. So about a month and a half after okay. all the stuff with Johnson and, and similar experience. I went home um, back to Southern California. Where in Soco? Uh, so I grew up in the Costa Mesa, Huntington Beach area. Okay. And um, so went back home and similar, kind of didn't know. You know, I had some money burning a hole in my pocket. I wasn't sure based on how things were going up until that point with the deployment. This was actually another one of those ones that I, I truly didn't know if I was going to be making it back from. So, you know, at as a 21, 22-year-old kid, what are you going to do? Go to Vegas and, you know, <laughs> enjoy your time. So you went to the Spearmint Rhino and spent all your money. Uh, well, no, I, ended up, I ended up spending it all at uh, one of the nightclubs there with just my cousins and a bunch of friends that we had all gone out there and, and, and just... Uh, but but the spearmint rhino may have been on the yeah. on the docket as well. <laughs> Michael, do you know what the spearmint rhino is? No, shocker. I have no idea. Fill us in. What is the spearmint rhino? I have heard it's a library, but <laughs> 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 do you guys think that the mid tour leave is a good idea? I see. I I understand why they do it. I understand if you were to write out like, hey, a year long deployment, 
in the middle of that. Let's give people the ability to. We had guys not come back. Well, and you know, would it have helped if they like didn't let you come all the way home? Like they had some destination, you know, I mean, some proximal destination you could Hang go out to. In Qatar. <laughs> well, somewhere where you could go to unwind, right, and actually get rest and recovery, which it's supposed to be. Going to Vegas, which is exactly what I would have done, and <laughs> getting shit faced and just like completely disassociating yourself from reality is not actually R and R. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just completely blowing off steam and an unhealthy manner, which I have zero judgment of because I've done exactly the same thing. But that's what they're all going to do. I mean, how is that person coming back emotionally stable after that? You know what I mean? It's, it's just a really weird thing to do in the middle of a deployment to lift him, shift him like that, not only from a physical perspective, but there's a lot of emotional geometry going on in there. I just, I don't, it wasn't something that they did with us because our deployments were traditionally shorter. shorter. Yeah. I'm just curious for those of you who have experienced it, if you think it was actually a good idea or a bad idea in hindsight. Yeah. I think it was a, a welcome reprieve uh, through the several different deployments I did and, and ranges of the, the lengths of them. Cause I did a 15 month deployment of 12 and then a nine. So the nine was nice. You get there, you're you know, essentially integrating, you know, and then by the time you're kind of set up, getting your ways, it's almost time to start getting ready to go back. The 12 is different, and then obviously the 15, it just feels so like you're there forever. Now. You live there now, you're feral, like it's Lord of the Flies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's nice, it's a welcome reprieve, but like you said, you know, you just kind of go on, and you, you disassociate completely, more so than you might disassociate while you're, you know, in country, in a sense, and, and just that kind of fuck it mentality of like, I'm here and just kind of in the meat grinder and just kind of get through the day. And, you know, how do we, how do we keep everybody alive? How do we keep everybody going? How do we keep the morale up to a regard and, and just keep pushing through, you know, mission first and, you know, we'll be home from here some, sometime, hopefully. Yeah. yeah I'm not arguing for or against yeah. it. It's just, I mean, I think you kind of could lose focus though. I mean, really is, yeah. would it I be better it's... to, if like, if you're in Afghanistan, it would be better just to have an entire area in Kandahar or Bagram where they, they just don't fuck with you for two weeks, right? Like a gym, you could, you know what I mean? It's literally like to ah, make it, it be the same though. I, I'm not saying it would be the same, but it would allow you to take a break without having to remove your mind or body from that tactical environment that you're going to have to go back into. I'm just thinking of ways to detach the gears yeah. and engage mm -hmm. the gears. I, mean, I have no idea if this would be beneficial. See, and I'm just thinking from my perspective is that if you did that, in my mind, if I was sitting back in Kandahar, I honestly wouldn't want to be there. I'd want to, I'd be like, I'm close enough to where I should be out there. Okay. Yeah. I could see that as well. You know, that'd be more frustrating to me. Yeah. Than that full. Yeah. I don't know the answer. Yeah. 15 months overseas in one location. That's a long time. <laughs> Even a year. Nine mm -hmm. months is a long time. I mean- well, and this is like, you have to think as well as, I mean, we were living down in these areas. Like, mm -hmm. this is not like a removed, like, you could spit on the town Morgan that was right behind us, you know, and uh, local kids would come by and we'd throw them some dollars off the wall for, you know, five bucks was would get you a stack of flatbread. That was, oh, that was awesome. You know, they make it with their feet, right? I know. Never bothered me. I didn't care. <laughs> Stronger man than I It was am. delicious. That's the flavor. <laughs> It yeah. was extremely delicious until <laughs> I saw a man who I'm going to assume last washed his feet when fucking Jesus was on earth <laughs> making the bread. I was like, Argh! and that was it. I could not do it anymore. Right. I used to eat the shit out of that stuff. Oh. And I'm sure that in the cooking process, it's all, you know, whatever, burned off. But uh, I'm sorry. It was a bridge too far for me. Oh, no. We, we did this one KLE. <laughs> so, I mean, I know how- KLE is a key leader engagement. Oh, I went with the acronym again. <laughs> so, we're during this key leader engagement. And- um, come down and I think it was my platoon sergeant didn't want to go in on this one. He's like, just take my spot. I'm like, he didn't want to drink tea that was strong enough to make you a type two diabetic in the right? moment. <laughs> just that <laughs> gigantic Kandari chai. Like, yeah. whoa, no, that's uh it's domino sugar. Imagine people, a shot glass, actually probably three or four shot glasses in volume and it's full to sugar essentially up to the brim and they pour a little bit of fluid on that. That's exactly what it tastes like from chai a shot. Time. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm talking <laughs> Insta diabetes, and especially because like you're not exposed to that amount of sugar out there. So then when they boom, when they hit you with that, cool. and you can't you can't really say I don't want any because in that culture, not the best. Well, and this was so during this one, they actually had like they were doing the full on shakshuka. Yeah, and I got this. Uh, they came around and they were given the meat pieces, and I got this. They slapped down this big fatty piece of goat. I can't refuse this. 
And huh? I'm, oh yeah, huh? I w- that's that's exactly the reaction <laughs> I was having. I'm like, about it I'm like, don't throw up, man. Like, do not throw up in front of these people, like with this. And do you ever think they were fucking with us? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think so too. For sure, I would have been. They had to oh, have known. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> had to have known. They're not stupid. <laughs> God, let's you know see what, what I, we can get them to eat. You know yeah. what I struggle with in some of those? The chai boys. And the, I, mm-hmm. I, I go there too. It. I couldn't do it, and I stopped going to them. Yeah, um, that was actually one of Michael the things. Michael Google Afghanistan chai boy. That and uh, Bachabazi is actually the. And you know what? The the, the Bachabazi is like the full ceremony. The chai boy is like just what the small child is mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah human trafficking I it's mean, 100% what it is traffic. it's it's the worst <sighs> and i know that we were supposed to do our best to not uh, judge or partake in or not judge or interrupt their culture raping little boys yep. is beyond what i can tolerate we were there when that whole thing went down with that green beret yeah and that was actually one of the things in helmand province what'd you find michael yeah Pull it up. You've already told me what this was. Pull it up. Yeah, audience needs to know because, like, I mean, really, just see it. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, insane. that's. A, I'm going to tell you right now. That's a PG picture. And I and I cover this. I cover yeah, this Bashi-Bazi. in the in the book. And the fact that like we're down there and this Afghan police officer, okay, of this particular district there, offers his chai boy to our platoon sergeant, and he comes storming out of there, and he's like. Round it up. We're freaking leaving right now. Oh, yeah, I got read that part. You guys literally drove down the road and just kind of basically remained overnight just yeah. to be out of that area. But I don't even like I'm like, why didn't we like take that kid with us? Like what? And it, and it fell down under that where it's like, well, we can't mess with their culture. And I'm like, I wonder what would have well, happened if you did take that kid. Don't know. Yeah. We'll never know. Bachi Bazi is a custom that has been around Afghan tradition for centuries. Which so, is uh, uh, bullshit, by the way. Really? Yeah, do your do do the full research in it. Yeah, that actually started back in Mujahideen days, back in the um, in the mountains. So it's current. Bachi Bazi or dancing boys is an expression used in certain parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. It refers to a practice in Afghanistan engaging generally male children and male adults. The practice has turned into a centuries long tradition and involves sexual abuse and slavery of young boys by older, powerful men, often Pashtuns. I. I can't do it. No, it's disgusting. No. It makes me want to take what's on the inside of their head and deposit it on the outside of their head. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I've been told that's not appropriate. <laughs> so, yeah. so later on in it that works. deployment. It works. It's effective. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's how you end up in prison, though, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Later on in that deployment, um, that was – it's it's called the, uh, the 1508 incident. So – we weren't at this compound. This is uh, 800. It's crazy once you actually do the, the math and everything. It was 850 meters down the road. And we didn't even know these guys were going to be staying there. We wouldn't have if it wasn't for the Blue Force tracker mm-hmm. popping up. And our platoon sergeant was like, who's this? Sent out a patrol. I was on that one. And we come down, and it was uh, – everyone called it the prison. So there's big white walls and everything else. But it was a, it was a police compound out there. Mm-hmm. It might have been a prison at one time. And – one of the towers, the barracks were in the bottom. You know, we came down there to basically share, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we're seeing is uh, TTPs and enemy SOPs. And Was it ODA that was parked up in there? No, it was uh, so HHC from, so we were two Fury and Bravo Company. It was HHC one Fury. Uh, I guess they were just doing a side-by-side mission. Huh. It was by where some of the ODAs were. Okay. Um, and we came down and they were, that first sergeant over there was basically told us off. Like, I don't need a bunch of freaking infantry bubbas telling me what to do. Get out of here. Sweet. Good call. <laughs> yeah. Well, what could local intelligence help you with? You know, I know, I get right? It. And how dare you guys try to help? <laughs> so they, they drove a donkey cart up to the side of the side of the wall, detonated in the middle of the night. And this barracks was underneath this tower. So we didn't have any of our guys in there. I actually questioned, I talked to, uh, the lieutenant colonel on the ground at the time. I was like, why wasn't anybody, why wasn't no U.S. in those towers? And long, long story short, it was, they weren't allowed to go through those barracks at night. So during the day, they could man the tower, but not at night. And I'm like, why? It's like, there was a lot of stuff going on there. I'm like, no, why? Tell me what was going on there. And he wouldn't, wouldn't say, but he's like, you can put two and two together. They didn't want us going through their barracks at night because yeah. they had chai boys there. And... 
So they detonate this donkey cart, blow a hole in the wall, complex ambush. They start coming through suicide bombers one after another. Um, you can actually, there's a podcast out there by, um, it was Major Scott Haran, I think at the time when he interviewed for it. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a captain at the time. I think in the book I said lieutenant, but he was actually a captain. And um, he wasn't even supposed to be there, but he led kind of the clearing through. But uh, when they came in through there, I mean, it was just, we ran to contact once we finally got clearance to go. And you come in there and it was, phew, I don't even think you could recreate this scene in a movie. You know, there was like uh, those big AC units. One of them, the tents were right up against this wall. Mm -hmm. You know, so they had a bunch of Alaskans. They were just blown over, just like they were just flicked. Yeah. Um, people were rolled up in them. You know, that's actually where they found the chaplain that passed away during that was rolled up in one of the tents and you know, it got thrown. Uh, but yeah, we were medevacking guys through there and everything. And it was just all because of you know, this tower. They didn't have security up in it. Um, there's probably a few other reasons, but yeah. Just think of that though, in a foreign country, in an area where you know you're at risk and you can't hold a security position. Because your host nation is too busy fucking little boys yeah. in their barracks. Okay. Okay. I mean, heads should roll for that. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, there's some stuff behind the scenes with that to where egos and other different things were to where it's just like, why? And I think that's a good reason why some of this wasn't covered, you know, and why the media sort of blind eye, you know, the military was like, oh, let's just brush <clears throat> this one under. I think that those are the things that should never be brushed under. I think TTPs, you know, tactics, techniques, procedures, or SOP, standard operating procedures, essentially protect the current warfighter by ensuring that you're not giving the enemy the playbook. Everything else, the more transparent that the military is with things like that, the better of an educated decision people can actually make. Yeah. I don't think people, when they hear what we've been talking about for the last few minutes, I don't think they're going to have an easy time believing it. Because they've never seen one of those boys show up in full fucking makeup. Eyeshadow and everything. Oh, no. red hair, red full palms. everything. Yeah. And you're just like, what in the actual fuck is going on right here? Yeah. I'll be outside. Yep. Because you can't do anything. I mean, I know what I want to do. I didn't have enough bullets in my magazines to do it. Yeah. But fuck. <laughs> That's the reality. Yeah. And you're told you got to be culturally sensitive to this. Like it's not not culturally sensitive. It's that's right or wrong. Freaking yeah. pretty clear as day to me. It's almost another thing you have to just kind of dissociate with and and you know it's you know you know it's morally wrong, you know it's unquestionably wrong, you know. Um and you just have to you, you sit there and dissociate with that, and you know what does that do? You know what kind of moral injury does that cause? You know yeah. down the road when you well, especially when it's not talked about. Mm -hmm. And again, like you know, anything that you stuff, I like to use my, uh, you know, my own personal trauma or anybody. <laughs> it's like a backpack. Just get it down there in the bottom. Yeah, yeah. and then hope to forget about it. Yep, yeah. and it doesn't. Yeah, what's the faster. best way to deal with the shit in the bottom of your backpack? Obviously, put other things on top of it. <laughs> stuff it all down. <laughs> stuff right. Let's start, stuff I mean, some fun stuff on top. And yeah. Then, yeah. But even through this, like with the guys, there was stuff that so many of these guys have not talked about. And even in talking with some of them during the interviews, they were, you know, one of them said it. I was dreading this call. I knew this call was coming. I was dreading this call. But then afterwards, after we had talked, you know, he called me back at a later date. And after everything, he was like, you know, I'm really glad that we talked, man. It feels like a burden's been It's lifted. cathartic. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't talked about this in so long. He said, like, it just feels like something's been lifted from my soul. I, you know, when I hear that from people, I wonder, my first question to them is, why? And I think I know the answer for most people. It's because they don't want to talk to somebody about it who doesn't have a, a shared or similar experience yeah. because they think that they're not going to be understood. And I can understand that headspace for sure. But that's also the same excuse that a lot of people make when it comes to go and talk to somebody like a mental health, fill in the blank, psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. Yeah. The number of times I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to go talk to that person because they've never lived through this or they don't have that, you know, they don't have this experience. They wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Like, you're right. They don't have that experience because they were spending the time while you 
were experiencing that trauma, mastering their craft of helping people offload that trauma. Yep. You don't have to have that same shared experience. If anything, what I found very revealing about the COVID time period is how destructive isolation is. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Yep. Even I mean, with spikes in suicide rates. Oh, my God. Across the board. And, and, you know, there's some people who are like truly introverted, introverted, like Ted Kaczynski motherfuckers, <laughs> which, by the way, that happened in Montana. One for us. <laughs> <laughs> I forget where. I was just talking with somebody about that. I was like, oh, shit, that's right. That crazy motherfucker was mailing bombs to people from Montana. Yeah. Maybe he does okay in isolation. But he also was like killing people with the postal service. He's a little nuts. Uh, yeah. For everybody else, I mean, you look at the number of people who got off the rails from just the isolation alone. I just, I, I again, I understand why people, and I'm not saying go to TGI Fridays and get shit fixed <laughs> on Dollaritas and talk to every single person that's around you and try to drag them into your persona of being yeah. a veteran and all these war stories. But if you have family, if you have people that care about you, mm -hmm. find a way to just communicate about your experience. And they don't have to, yeah. they don't have to have lived it. And what you're going to find is that they actually want to hear it. And they may not understand, but the cathartic nature of just offloading and verbalizing some of this stuff yep. is unbelievable. There's always a reason to put an excuse in front of you as to why you don't want to. But the impact I've seen in myself and in so many other people of just being able to work their way through, like the I was dreading this phone call. Yep. And then I bet you get a text like, hey, man, that was kind of awesome. Like, I feel better. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, and that's, that's. Imagine how long that fucker had that bottled. Yep. And that's part of what the whole reason why I brought Nick on here, too, is the fact that what he's involved in the organization that put this stuff together is removing that excuse. Hey, yeah. they haven't been there. So it's taking hard hit units that have had these experiences, bringing all these guys together, but having these clinicians on the side in order to offload. And these other guys that have been able to talk about it with a clinician and been like, look, man, you got nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. It's okay to talk about this stuff with someone. They know trauma. That's their field of expertise. Like, why aren't you talking with these people? It's actually okay to talk to somebody who doesn't even have that knowledge and expertise. Yeah. I mean, it's a different perspective. And again, yeah. they've trained. That's their job. Well, even if it's just your family. And again, I'm like, there's a time and place. Yeah. If you're at, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, like, pass me the potatoes, you motherfucker. Let me tell you a story about when I was in this shit. Like, yeah, let's maybe take it back a wrap. You know what I mean? But, I mean, I, I've had, I have a great relationship with my dad. We've had our ups and downs, too. And he's been on the podcast a few times. People are like, oh, it's so amazing. And it must have always been crazy. I'm like, no. Like, all relationships are a sine wave to a degree, right? Like they're going to mm -hmm. have the up and down. I just try to control the amplitude and frequency. That's all I can do. I know it's going to be up and down. But... I mean, he was in the military, but had a job that was nothing like my own. And just sitting down and talking to him, because sometimes he'll ask a question, or even my children will ask me a question, a broad question. Um, and they've asked me some very precise ones, and regardless of the age, I'll pick an age-appropriate answer. And it's interesting, yeah. as they age, their questions mature also. Mm -hmm. Even just thinking about ways, when my kids have asked me questions on how I can verbalize to them... Without like, so, you know, and then I slept all night on a guy's leg. You know what I mean? Like there's ways you can talk about the trauma that don't traumatize other people that will help you. People are not as alone as they think they are. No. But if you keep telling yourself that you are, you're a ticking time bomb. Yes. And I've seen it time and time again. Yeah. Yeah. Isolation is not, not the way to go. And I mean, one in particular that I'm thinking of is that he... You know, any of these type of events like that. And so, I mean, he's finally signed up to be at this, uh, this second one, which is yeah. awesome. You know, I, he's the one that's coordinating, you know, this particular one involving these guys from Bravo Company. So, like, the thing I'm talking about is called Operation Resiliency. Mm -hmm. And the, we were in the pilot. So we were in the first one. And I think that's just the fact that the uh, organization that put it on, the um, wife of one of the guys that had been 
you know, I mean, he had, uh, what was up with Verardo? I can't remember the, uh, you had, so, yeah. So Mike was hit, uh, he, he was hit two separate instances. One, he was in a vehicle, he was a gunner, a uh, vehicle rolled over. He suffered a pretty, um, severe TBI and uh, concussion from that, you know, naturally. He's lucky he lived in a yeah. rollover scenario. And Nuts. so, um, um, and then he was evac medevac to Kandahar or CAF. And then while he was there, there was, um, he was there for about two weeks and they gave him the opportunity to go back, but he wanted to come back and be out with his boys. So that very next patrol, uh, he went out on his first patrol being back and he had stepped on a PMN mat as well. That was, uh, uh, had spider wires going out to other jugs of HME, which, uh, which is homemade explosive. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, fortunately, th those didn't uh, go off. But he lost his leg, part of his arm, and they actually had to sew his arm to him, to his back as they were medevacing him out. Um, I believe. Um, he... Let's pause the story and rewind that. Did you say they sewed his arm to his back? So it was. I believe they had to sew it onto him so that it wouldn't fall off. Essentially, as they were medevacing <sighs> him out because it was so uh, severely injured and mangled. Um, so from that, um, you know, he, he's gone through 120 surgeries to be kind of where he's at today. And, um, you know, he just trying to survive through the wounds of war. So hmm. see, and that's 120 just 20 surgeries. Yeah. I'm at one now. I went 46 <laughs> years without one and now I'm at one. <laughs> I'm good. I don't need to add a two and zero to that. Yeah. God yeah, it's, damn. it's quite a bit, you know, and, and that's, a, you know, another thing that's not discussed is, you know, is, is with, uh, you know, those surgeries and compound injuries, you know, where does that lead, you know, with these guys that have these severe DVIs and, and everything like that as well. And, you know, it just creates a whole another, another uh, conversation for another time. But, you know, it, um, you know, what is the cognitive cognition breakdown of, you know, uh, multiple surgeries and multiple, um, you know, um, levels of anesthesia, you know, over time and stuff. And what does that do to you? You know, with a lot of these guys that, um, you know, that, that do have these amputations and have to go through, you know, 10, 12, 120 surgeries and everything. So there's still another level to that. Here's a question that only the three of you will likely understand. And people are going to hate me for asking this. Something not talked about often with IDs is that it blows your cock and balls off. Yeah. If you look down, you step on an IED, and your cock and balls are gone, would you rather A, <laughs> live, or B, if possible, they put a pneumatic hog on you the size of this fucking microphone stand you right here. You gotta pump it up. <laughs> you can't really feel it. Oh, man. I don't know. What would you go with? Mm. We're just talking massive fucking I stick with what just... I always told everybody else. You know, if it's gone, just, just, just end it. That's and that's God, that's how I was too. <laughs> yeah. Even if they had fucking fucking Robocock just ready to put on there, like I think I would. Michael's over there, like I'm never working for you again. <laughs> this, is it, this is the last podcast. episode. <laughs> I clarify, Michael, that nobody's going to understand this except the three of us. <laughs> yeah, and I mean the, the crazy part is, is I like, mean these conversations need to be had, Michael. They do. This, like some real talk. I what would I was you do? Still fired. What What would you do? No cock or Robocock? But you could barely feel Robocock. I don't know. Um, but it was a hog. Like, you could turn the lights on and off while still laying in bed with that thing. <laughs> this is a Dirk Diggler. No, that, that, that would be a micro penis. Hit Dirk was a micro penis. We're talking literally the oh, size okay. of this all fucking right. swing all right. arm. All right. What would you go with? Uh, I'm a big fan. I like the sci fi, like cybernetic stuff. So I'll go with the, the Robocock. The macro hog. He's yeah. sticking with nice. uh, all, right. all right. We had those conversations. Like, hey, man, if I step on one, I actually, yeah. I was like, hey, if I'm like dual above the knee yep, and like, or worse than that, do not yeah. save me. That's what I, I was just going to go into that yeah. on how we had these conversations. Do I told Doc, I was like, if I lose an arm, bring that's it. Like, I, I mean, I think I'd be okay with that in arm. Yeah. Yeah. Lining up on patrols before we go out, calculating how much we can bring back home, you know, at the end of the patrol. Uh, if I lose a leg and part of this, yeah, I got, you know. I was cool with a leg, but Why I wasn't. Why if you lose one arm, would that be too much? You can still do everything. No. Not what I want to do. What the fuck do you want to do? What about the cars? 
This is the the cars, 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 cars. No, this is downhill skiing <laughs> on dudes in a hot tub. If you know what I mean. So you oh, could do whoa, that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're the one who made the motion. <laughs> like, this is what I want to do. So I mean, all right, that's getting cut. No, what the fuck it is. I mean, I was <laughs> gonna say it. you could He's do that one handed. You could do that one handed, then just swivel and go to the other side. You could be like a fucking back. My question is, how come you have so much experience here? Like, what's your? Uh, where are you going with this? Between the two of us, one of us <laughs> demonstrated those hand signals, and it wasn't on this side of the He's table. He's kicking it back this way. See? He's oh. they, I know a guy who has no arms who can drive. You know what I mean? Like, they have all these different setups for cars that you can, that you can work. Oh, one right. arm, huh? That would be enough for you? In that instance, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Nick, where's your threshold? This is interesting. <laughs> I mean. How much of your body could you lose before you're like, fuck this? I, so with legs and everything like that, you know, a, a high double would be hard and stuff. But I've seen, you know, working where I where I'm at, I've seen some pretty pretty off the wall stuff, and you know, the resiliency some of these guys have. So it's it's hard for me. How you about know, high this double? Point. High double though, no cock. Oof, done. Okay, done. High double wow. with cock. Well, yeah, I can. People are going to love I can this deal conversation, with by the way. Say, you're you're really this covering, one's off the rails. We, no, we're just covering ground that most people don't think about. Yeah, Your first how many times, I mean, how many times ever can people sit down and legitimately talk about, is life worth it without your hog? You know, like, <laughs> so high double, these, no yeah. cock, you're out, but high double with cock, you're in. Yeah, I could deal with that. I think I can make do. All right. How you about know? a triple? Oof, that's mm. where it gets hard, you know? Yeah. That's where you start, you know, uh, that's rough. Yeah, looking. Yeah. Well, yeah, That's exactly. all you got. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, join the conversation. How much of your body could you live without before he's you? He's the robo it? guy. He's gonna. He's gonna segment. Uh, he's, he's gonna augment. I mean, one, one leg. One, one leg below the knee. Yeah. No. I mean, that would. One leg above the knee. Uh. Yes. Two legs below the knee. Yes. Two legs above with cock. Yes. Without cock. Is Robo Hog included? <laughs> Not in this scenario. That was a. Com- How dare you bring up Robocop? That was a completely different scenario. In that case, probably not. I think that's the litmus for most dudes. Yeah, yeah, that's where <laughs> it completely all unscathed, and your dick is gone. They're like, I quit a life. Their, their life centers around it's their over. penis. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at a genetic baseline level, it's that's I mean, true. God, it's, are it's, we anything yeah. more than a fucking yeah. delivery a system for dick. dick? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My other girlfriend used to say, I'm just a dick dragging around the body. So, For everybody listening, you're welcome. I think this is probably a really educational podcast. We went there. Yeah. It's, I mean, this is PhD level <laughs> education in my mind. Men with experience. Yeah. Michael's going to probably just walk out of the room at this point. He's never, he's never been this deep down the rabbit hole. <laughs> All right. So we've established where we're at. For me, it was anything beyond like a double. Okay. I don't... I mean... I just can't even imagine it. I, I and, and maybe in that moment you would like be so violently trying to change your mind and convince the people that you had spent a lot of time saying, "Hey, don't say me." Like I was joking, you know. But I think regardless, it doesn't matter. I think they would anyway. I think they would too. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's pretty wild that the three of us had all walked up to and thought about and then crossed that threshold emotionally of like, what is too much? What do I want to do? And then you have that conversation with your friends. Oh, it went further. I mean, we had conversations on, I mean, there were, well, you know, you talk about everything. Yeah. You know, they was talking about the, the most uh, fucked up way to commit suicide, you know, and that one came down to, that was Doc Schultz. Uh, he said something about super gluing his hands to his head, doing a bungee jump off of a bridge with an overpass, okay? Okay. And piano wire that was slightly less around his neck so that his head, he'd be bobbing upside down from this overpass, holding his head, you know, That's as, one of the wildest things I've ever Right? <laughs> and that's why I was like, you can't top that. You cannot top that. Oh, if you give me a second here, we might be able to. Oh, I'm sure we could. Very sure fucked could. up imagination. But yeah, that's, maybe that's a topic for another day. Yeah, but going down that dark hole yeah. of that is like... I, I remember I was leaving Cop Johnson once to go out there and just thinking, you know, who's it going to be next? Is it going to be me? Who's it going to be? And stopping myself and say, dude, all right, you're getting in your head about this right now. You need to get out and you need to decide right now, like, what the deal is. And it was, I'm already dead. It's only a matter of time till it catches up. How are you going to live? 
And that was it. From there, I kind of realized, and it was like so freeing at that point. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at this point. Live in the moment. Be there for the guys. Who cares what happens next? Just be there. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that headspace for sure. Yeah. And I'll go back to that from time to time when I start like doubting something or, you know, and it's like, well, dude, you're already gone, man. So what are they going to remember you for? I've, uh, I've heard that, um, and I haven't looked into this very deeply, but a lot of research sh shows that quality of life actually improves yeah. the more that you think about your own mortality. Yeah. I've seen some Why things out, it? I've seen some things out there where it's like a, have you seen these, Michael, where it's a chart of the number of weeks you potentially have in your life and you cross it out like a very power? I think people can take it a, a touch too far. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Course. They're sitting there, you know, I can, I'm just going to sit here and meditate over how I'm going to die. I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> dude. Maybe taking the spirit of that a touch too far. But yeah. I think, I think being confronted with your own mortality and... I think, uh, was it Marcus Aurelius was saying you could, should consider mortality yeah, twice a day. That's all that stoicism. Also, yeah. again, maybe I, that's, a, that's a lot. You know, that's like 730 times a year you're thinking about your own death. I mean, okay, I haven't tried it. So I can't say, uh, you know, for better or for worse, but I don't think it's bad to put yourself in that thought process because it provides a lot of context on what you should be really focusing on and doing yeah. with your time. Yep. Yeah. What's important. And I, I think, I mean, we visit that in the military. I have another instance too, to where, I mean, my father is to the point where he's, you know, he was successful in business, mm -hmm. you know, but at the end of the day, I mean, he retired, did very well for himself, but at the end of the day, he's got this disease. That's just uh it's a, it's called pomp a disease, pomps disease for short. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it has something to do with the amino acids to where muscles never regrow. They never, they, it's always atrophying. It's always getting worse to the point to where, you know, you can have everything in the world, pay for whatever in the world. Yeah. But if you don't have that and to see someone who was, you know, a college football star down to, um, you know, wheelchair bound, can't get around on his own anymore. What does that end up looking like at the end for him? Just, I mean, to the point to where you can't even, you know, I mean, he can't breathe at night. At, at night, he's hooked up to a machine because by the end of the day, his oxygen levels in his blood are so low. What do you think about, like, Canada right now has a legal assisted suicide? What are your thoughts on that? Would you rather, to put yourself in your father's shoes, which is obviously a horrible thought process. Yeah. Well, I know the type but, of person that he is, so but I would already you, know the answer. But would you saying. rather have no control and in that incremental slide down the hill or be able to choose a point in time where you could ethically and humanely make that choice for yourself. For me, I'd take the latter. Hmm. I would rather end it on my own terms. Own terms, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying it's for everybody. It's interesting that Canada has that uh, ability, though. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure it can be abused, but they have some, you know, the things in place to make sure that it's not being abused, which, just, of course, doesn't mean you can't gain the system. But what's more humane? But is there really a difference in between telling someone like some doctor, you know, all right, I'm, I'm done. I, I want to check out to well, they have to have like a, to your own self. I mean, I mean, well, you know, talk about your, I know nothing about your father's medical condition, but what about somebody who is a paraplegic or quadriplegic and no longer has the ability to make that choice? Mm. You know what I mean? People who are in a place where their, their choice is the chemotherapy is going to kill you or for the next six months your body is going to you know the end state is going to be the same do you want to take control over that end state or do you want to have to ride that lightning all the way through it i think i would ride it just because of the fact of you're your own you're in your own headspace you control that end i'd say ride it until you got to the place where you wanted to be able to make that choice you know what i mean i'm not saying people should choose either way yeah. but it's, it's just interesting you know it's something that canada has that we don't have hmm. um and you know, and better maple syrup. I guess I've been told by every Canadian that they also have that. I mean, it's just there never is a good answer on that, though. You know, there's I not. Mean, it's a personal answer, exactly. But in our our country, you don't actually have that choice. So it's kind of you, you got to ride the lightning all the way to the end. No, or take matters in your own hands. But unfortunately, but again, if you that's... can though, oof. Like I've been trying to check my dad into a home for weeks, and he just won't go. Yeah, I was telling Michael he got kicked out of Best Buy. Here in Kalispell. Oh, no. Two weeks ago. What's the, is it like dementia or? 
That's what I think. He's completely uh-huh. mentally fine. He's just out of his fucking mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, he went in there and uh, had some choice comments for some of the employees and got escorted oh, out. I tell man. him every time I see him, I'm like, I'm going to put you in a home soon. He's like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> 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 no, He's the best. But I'm like, God damn it, I'm putting you in a home the second I can. <laughs> Safer that way, yeah? Yeah. What the fuck were we talking about? We were talking about cocks. All right. <laughs> back on track. All right. Dive back into the book. Where were we? You're on your deployment. I mean, we've bounced around. We've gone everything from... Uh, that's everything. what happens, man. We had Johnston, but I mean, it, it just all goes into... Like, if you look at... I guess we could go into the fact of, you know, that separation to where I kind of pointed to him for Verardo because Verardo, we were so separated. Like, when when that happened, when uh, we got pushed out to Johnston and the other guys got pushed out to Diakashi where Cop Brunk was, um, we were so separated that... You know, I had no idea what had happened to Berardo. I had no idea. There was other guys to when we all got back to Kandahar at the very end, when you're getting ready for ripping out a country, taking that plane back out. Mm-hmm. Hey, where's this guy? Dude, you didn't know? Wow. Yeah. And it was just this stuff didn't get passed around either to the fact that they didn't want to tell us um, the separate platoons or just the fact that we were blind to it because it was the op tempo was so crazy. I mean... My old platoon sergeant, uh, I was talking with him before I came in here, but, I mean, he's still in sergeant major level now. But I saw him when we were down in North Carolina, and he was like, has your sleep cycle ever been the same since then? And I'm like, no. Hmm. No, never. Do you think it ever could be? Um, I've headed back towards that path. I've gotten a lot better at it just because of how important I see sleep is. You know, I what are you doing to try to improve it? Uh, so a lot of the things with me is racing thoughts at night. Mm-hmm. Um. So I'll go into medical marijuana on that end. Better than what I was using. I was using uh, Unisom, you know, to the point. Sleep aid? Yeah. Yeah. But to the point on where I was taking, you know, triple what you're supposed to. You know, it checks out. Yeah. What's your medical marijuana tool of choice? Uh, so, I mean, if it's in a pinch, just a, just a vape, you know, live resin. Um, I'll go something. I'm, you know, I'll go after the, the terpenes. Yeah. You know, it's chasing the, the highest quality product that you can. As opposed to... You ever go the gummy route? I have. Um, the thing with gummies, and I know they're starting to change this end, but a lot of that medicinal end of things disappears when they go through making the gummies because they're not <laughs> pressing. Like When you look at how they process live resin comparatively, they're actually cryogenically freezing the plant and then using a press to press out your actual resin material. It's the closest you can get to what the actual plant is. You're pulling the extract from there. Um, and that's where you're going to go with those medicinal properties. And I know I show up to these dispensaries and I say this stuff. I'm like, Hey, I'm looking for this, for this particular reason. And I get the guys like, I don't know, man, everyone else just wants to get high. So and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I feel like the vape, which I, I don't think I've ever vaped weed. I feel like you can control the dosage better than some of these gummies. You can get yourself on a little ride that you can't get off. <laughs> That's why I ask. It's, it's a very different experience for sure. Well, and he's uh, – so Nick has a lot more experience on the end of the psychedelic end of things. Yeah. And I know I have in You're not a fucking shaman, are you, Nick? No. You're no. going to change your not name? To, not today. You know, change the world tomorrow. <laughs> if you s- get over there and you start telling me about how enlightened you are, I'm going to slap the fucking shit out of you. You have a really good you know, vibe <laughs> to you right now. I-, <laughs> I absolutely believe that there – can be a therapeutic use of that, and I have watched so many people get lost in just the usage of Absolutely. those drugs. Absolutely, you can, and they want to tell me how enlightened they are and how they were, you know, like they reconnected with film. And I'm like, that's awesome. What are you doing past that? Oh, you know, I'm just gonna go back, you know, and go. Mm. I'm like, Fuck. Well, you, you supplement one form of crazy for another, and then it just goes off the rails. And I've yeah. seen that too, you know, with other buddies kind of cruising cruising that route, and uh, you know, now you're just here to continue to get high because you like the you like it or, or whatever and and uh well that's that you know, you're, mis- you're that's missing not, that yeah. initial intent or that initial purpose of what you may were maybe we're looking for to maybe get over that hurdle and try to work towards a better life yeah so and that's where you know i've had both um was a heroic hearts project you know reach out and say hey come mm-hmm. come down to costa rica with us and everything yep and I didn't because I've been in touch with Hopkins and I'm like, I want to do this. You know, as soon as you do something like that, you're disqualified from all those other studies. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I see the value in it and I'm like, yes, I want to be part of this. I want to try to help out with some of this. But 
Uh, I know when I had my stuff in for a study with Hopkins, you know, and to use it in a clinical type capacity, mm-hmm. uh, there was a show, I can't remember who it was, but it was on Rogan. And all of a sudden, like there, they just had a flood of so many people trying to get into it. They just cut the program completely. And I was like, that's a shame. That sucks. Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah. To where it's someone trying to make a difference. And then it's, you know, the flood of people. I want this experience. It's not about that end, man. Like, I mean, that's part of it, but you're trying to actually get a means to an end here. What kind of racing thoughts at night do you have? Are they specific to one particular topic or is it you just feel like your mind is kind of stuck in fifth gear? Fifth gear. It's everything going on around me. So I'm constantly like thinking that large scale, like, all right, where does everything fit? Where is this going? How, you know, my project over here with this, like, like working five steps ahead of everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, man, you you do this in your meditation and. Why is it? Why are you doing this now? You're supposed to be winding down for the day. I say either it doesn't want to, I don't know, and you're forcing that. Are you grabbing onto those thoughts, or are you letting your mind kind of just churn your way through them? Letting it go through them. Yeah, kind of like you're watching TV. Yeah, I struggle with. Uh, oftentimes, I'll wake up in the middle of the night, like around two a.m. Okay, and I have to be very careful engaging with my thoughts. Because if my brain hits a certain revolution and I and I put too much energy into it, I'm up. Yep. And it sucks. Yep. It happened to me today at like four thirty in the morning. Oof. And I lay there. And it, I mean, I went to bed relatively early. I am, you know, post surgery. I'm definitely trying to like maximize health, recovery, going to bed at a reasonable hour. So, not when I would want to get up. Mm-hmm. But I felt it was like, yeah, you know, I've got enough rest. But it's the same thing. It's a thought that will enter into my mind. Sometimes I can sit there and either w- through working on breathing or just reminding myself, like, you can't control where your mind goes. You can't control your thoughts, but you can control whether or not you grab onto them. Yeah. And just maybe sit back and watch the TV and sometimes I'll drift back into sleep. But, you know, morning was t- this morning was one of those days where I just grabbed onto it. It's, it's tough. I don't think it's something that's unique to uh, military members. No. I think it's something that happens just a little bit later in life when you got a lot of shit going on and you have stress and you're trying to figure what the fuck am I supposed to be doing with my life? But it's rough. I mean, yeah. you know, when you talk about prioritizing health and you start doing a little research, you can do almost anything you want to. Mm-hmm. If you don't address your sleep, you're kind of pissing in the wind. Yeah. There's, There's a lot of things you can do that are just wasted until you start identifying that rest, recovery, and sleep. Yep. The, uh, man, the thing that you were talking about that aired earlier today. I think you might have recorded it on Monday. Probably. Um, oh, the Friday episode, yeah. Yeah. You went through some of that, you know, and that's exactly right. Yeah. Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Lay there awake at two in the morning and let your mind race, but don't really think about it. <laughs> have fun with unpacking that one, everybody. Let's <laughs> go back to sleep. Yeah. Wish I would have thought of that. Yeah. It's yeah. like telling somebody in an argument, you know, don't get so angry. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Instant. <laughs> Instant, yeah. <laughs> All right, back on deployment. What's going on? Where are we? Mm. We're in the ARV. What's going on? Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, chronologically, you know, um, we just left off with, uh, you know, Johnson and then where we're going and through February, I think we're around the like March, April time frame. So yeah, you I, went, I went on leave and, and yeah. then that's when, I mean, the Ides of March. So that's actually that's, like right before Brunk. That was, we had. So yeah, Brunk was March 31st. We had the instance first, uh, the suicide bomber. Mm-hmm. Um, that one was uh, same town, Diakache. That's kind of where the epicenter was. And um, oh man, that one. Well, we went into that one. Man, you about just threw V-bid? me off. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not talking about the. V- so I mean, we could talk about V-bid the V-bid is a vehicle-borne IED. I got <laughs> you guys. We're good. <laughs> you're my. You're my. <laughs> the glossary just shows up. <laughs> We're good. I got you. <laughs> it's in the back of the book. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, so the the thing with the suicide bomber, that was where we came in to do a key leader engagement with, we were just walking out in the fields one day, coming across one of the grape fields into this town. And we came across a, I mean, this guy looked old as hell, which really means he was just 40. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the interpreter comes up and he starts talking to him and the guy speaks perfect English. Studied at Oxford in England. Really? Yeah. Came back into Afghanistan. Yeah, it's a little sketchy, but not crazy. Yeah, not unheard of, but that's a little weird. And so he was rigged weird. up. No, uh, no, no, no. This is where. Is, so from there, okay, we got this like follow-on meeting. All right, so in this hot town in this area, so they decide they're going to set up a T intersection. 
you know, T, T intersection, we're going to hold the KLE in this compound over here. Mm -hmm. And we go in and we start talking to the guy and it's maybe we were there for maybe five minutes. And, um, that was third squad. So Sergeant Thomas was in charge of that patrol and we're in there for maybe five minutes and just this whole freaking compound. Just go, boom. Oh shit. What just happened? And we go running out and a suicide bomber had come up to one of the blocking positions. Uh, and the pressure plates were on this guy's knees. Interesting. Yeah. So he comes up and he just, it, his goal as a suicide bomber, close as much distance as yeah. he can, you know, and you have this kid on the saw, you know, the, uh, machine gun five, five, six on the corner squad, automatic weapon. There you go. Very Thank you. Glossary. Cyclic. <laughs> <laughs> and he's combined with, uh, with an Afghan police mm -hmm. and, um, the kid kind of hesitated to where the police officer came up. And that's when the so guy, they knew something was off. Yeah, the the guy just looked sketchy for sure. Almost as if he was getting ready to fucking blow himself up. Ah, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know what that. You know, I mean that <laughs> mindset. You know, yeah, of course. Um, his last moments. You know, nobody, and he's facing that. But he puts his hands up. You know, so you're like, oh, okay. You kind of put your guard down. Goes to his knees and poof, disappears. You know, the the exact thing was that this kid. His account of it sees this guy's rib cage flying through the air at him. Um, was it a vest? Yeah. So full of ball bearings. Did they find his head? I don't know if they ever found his I know you're talking about, though, where they balloon out and they mushroom out. Their head usually survives. Mm. Yeah. Fucking awesome. Yeah. I found his ear. That's what I'm talking about. That's uh, when I came up, I'm doing the blood sweep on this kid, and he's got a, and on his yeah. shoulder, there's an ear. And I swiped that thing off, and I kind of grabbed my assault pack and put it down on it. He's like, what was that? Like, Nothing, dude. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so during that, this guy goes off, and one of the team leaders, Sergeant Lee, runs to, you know, as this yelling is happening, he's running towards, like, all right, what's happening? And where he just was, his backpack was sitting there full of holes. You know, and he actually had a ball bearing ping off of, um, he had a, his magazine was a P-Mag, mm -hmm. you know, his Magpul ones. Yeah, plastic. Ricocheted off of there, but his rounds were just spilling out. And wow. stuff. Yeah. I mean, talk about close call. And the, uh, two of the guys were hit. So Sergeant Thomas took, I don't know if it was one or two to the chest. I can't remember. In that one, yeah. But, uh, you know, he had a collapsed lung. And the other guy, well, Will Ross from before almost separated his shoulder it like hit, it went right through and through but mm -hmm. um where it was they were like if it was just a little bit more your shoulder just would have been clean off <sighs> you know and this is what we come up to and uh you know i call it up i run and we didn't have you know i, I couldn't get any radio signal out where we were i had to run back into where the kle was because i knew i had comms from there and i'm shooting stuff out and they're all resetting everything our, our turp actually grabbed up uh because that afghan police went down too you know, he got hit and our, uh, interpreter Gucci at the time grabbed up the AK and he's like, man, that guy just going from like the, the villagers are coming out of their house. Like what happened? He's yelling at him, freaking get back in. He had, uh, worked with soft before. So, I mean, he was, we trusted him, but to the point where we were like, all right, we have people coming out here, man. Like we've got it up, get back in here. Was that guy from the village? No, uh, he was out actually from Helmand province. You no, know I mean, the guy who clocked oh. himself off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're in, around, and among. It's tough. Well, this is like, I mean, we're talking maybe probably a month prior. We had gone down there and it was a, oh, you know, bad guys came through here and we, we don't have a speaker for our mosque. You know, we need some wire and a battery. <laughs> and uh, someone stupidly gave him that. And that just goes missing, you know? What do you think was going on there, man? Like, we just literally supplied these guys with stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Good relations, my ass. And, I mean, that really was. That was the epicenter. And I think it was after that to where it was decided, like, we need to put a compound in over there. Um, and shortly thereafter was the day that Brunk got hit. Um, that was one to where he was on that patrol. But, I mean, he you – were, you were on that one? Yeah, because uh, that was uh... – a. That was like a company company wide op. I mean, there was uh, a lot of moving parts. There's, that there's day, a man. lot of moving pieces to that I know um, we were, you know, with with Charlie Company because they were keeping up with us across the river. Um, but yeah, our platoon was was 
charged with a different objective with that as we were clearing, what was it, to the uh, east, I believe, or well, something like so that. So the night before, this kid that came out as a replacement for us, uh, is Private Shane Betts, first patrol. All right, he's replacing some other kid that got hit. You know, our numbers were down. We only had, like, at that point, I think it was, like, 29 guys at that point. Uh but also having to pull tower guard, also having to do, you know, all the different duties you do on a base, plus run patrols. Yeah, it's, it's just never ending. Nuts. Yeah, you're like a guy shoving his fingers in a dam that's leaking. Yeah. So first time out, and on the way back, this kid hits a toe popper, and it was buried too deep. You know, we actually thought, you know, he's on the ground screaming and stuff, and me and Doc run up, and I'm like, how bad is Doc? And he's like, dude, I, he's still got his foot. And they, lucky him. You know, I mean, this thing, it shattered his ankle, mm -hmm. but it was buried too deep. Um, but then that, you know, they sent out one of the other, uh, one of the other squads to sit on it overnight. We came back in cause it was like a three day mission. So we were on the tail end of that. Me and, um, Paul Martinick cleared the landing zone and they just had a medevac as soon as the other squad came up from there. The next morning they wake up and I'm on talk duty at that point. Tactical Operations Center. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Think of it as like a hub. You know, yeah, like you're sitting on radio. Planners, radios. Sometimes you can have drone feeds in there. It's like uh, it looks a lot like CSI. Sometimes, honestly, like the offices at CSI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm on there and uh, the platoon sergeant. So we were out there with the LT the night before. Platoon sergeant's in. And he calls up, you know, man, we're in the middle. Like, how did you guys get out of here? Like, they're in the middle of a minefield. Like, as the sun comes up, they're starting to see the things in the trees and the different markers and everything else. And he's like, we are in the middle of a freaking minefield. And I have no idea how we deleted that bird without, yeah. you know. I mean, me and, I, me and Martinick zigzagged across where they landed. You know, we stepped on most of the ground. Yeah. How we didn't just, no clue. And then from that, as they're coming out, EOD was coming out with you guys as you're clearing through. Yeah, so we had cleared um, We had cleared up to a certain point, and then I think all the stuff with bets went down. We were moving back into position because there was another explosion, and that's when all the squad leaders were checking in, and we were trying to get comms up on the company fill. And uh, we were missing our squad leaders, uh, Roger up, you know, him rogering up for um, – that he and his guys were good for uh, first squad and third platoon, and they were separate from us. So we were moving, and uh, we were Staff Sergeant J. So we were moving into a different position, and that's where we had walking by this one wall that we walked past several times before, you know, on file because we got the guys on the mine hound up front trying to clear it as best as possible. And uh, basically, we had walked by five times prior, you know, a small little two foot wide goat yeah. path next to a wall uh that had already been cleared numerous times but i guess you know um just that one little spot that nobody that everybody had just missed that much prior is, is what did it and that's when edinger got hit and um so his was uh below the knee single leg below the knee um i was a couple guys back from him we established the hlz uh helicopter oh, landing there you zone. go i was about to hop <laughs> he in caught it, he caught yeah, it. gotcha <laughs> um and then from there, we were trying to figure out what was going on with Brunk, and nobody had eyes on him. Um, the guys in his squad could probably best tell their aspect of that story, but basically he had gone to excavate a site to figure out how to get to where we were with Edinger, from my understanding. And after we were pushing out from Edinger's HLZ, we had walked essentially into a minefield and now we, we're going forward, and there's mines. We go to the left, there's mines. Right, yep. there's mines. Behind us, there's mines. So we essentially call DOD, and we're like, you guys need to come kind of back out here real quick. Um, and then at that point is when we started unfolding that they were, you know, nobody had eyes on where uh, Brunkhorse was, where he had been. There was a – they found a crater in one of the walls, and they tried to excavate it, but they, you know, and they they weren't seeing anything, you know, no no signs of life or that he was there before until they looked up and into the tree and they saw his rifle, and they pretty much identified that as the site where he was and essentially he vaporized. Yeah. In the – IED's encounters that you guys had, did you also start, start taking small arms fire? 
in any Never. of these? That was the worst part about it. You know, I always that say it was like fighting ghosts. Wild. There's no retribution. There was no anything. You know, it was, it was like fighting ghosts. Because more often than not, at least in my experience, the IED complex. is to get people to stop moving. Yep. To induce a situation where other people start coming. And then it's like this plunging PKM fire. You know what I mean? Like, it is complex. What, what they're trying mm. to do is put a hitch in the giddy up of the element moving through and then they launch. Suck you into certain areas. Or and, just stop mm, you. Yeah. They need to fix you in place long or call in a helicopter, right? Let's get a helicopter to hover mm-hmm. and start hucking RPGs at this thing. It's interesting that they never combined it with small arms fire. This one in particular, and this is where you, you didn't read through this yet. And so, oh, yeah. So there, I got to talk to the EOD team guys too. And on how that site was set up, Mm -hmm. where Sergeant Brunk had gotten, it was actually, they had watched us and they had watched how EOD reacted and how they did site exploitation. And that's what he was doing was the area where he was, where the actual charge was, they made it, it was like a false, false pop. So they made it to where the EOD, that was meant to take out the EOD team. Oh yeah. So they were doing this stuff in order to draw EOD in. Hey, these are their assets on that. Like, let's hit it. You know, and they did the same thing across the river um, with the guys over at Charlie. We had a sniper team that had worked with us. Um, it was Moon, a Specialist Moon and um, Sergeant Rush. And they get talked about in Helmand Province when they were assigned to 1st Comp- or 1st um, Platoon. And there's another guy, and I got to hear this end of the story, which is kind of cool with, with this book is through this and through that other book, Charlie Company has sort of put down their story as well. He actually just got a deal. On the, as I was flying here, I had got him in touch with the publisher and I got him you know, a sit down and now he's got a contract deal. Awesome, good for him, man. So, and it's kind of cool just because of seeing that other perspective. We're hearing these hellacious gunfights every other day over there. So it's like where we're hitting you know, this stuff with landmines and with, like Nick just said, fighting ghosts. They're just a very kinetic fight. Yeah, they're in direct engagements, yeah. But they did. They that's what they did with you know most of that patrol had crossed over, and they knew Moon was taking heads over there, and they just waited for him. And <sighs> it was heart wrenching to read that chapter in there, and I was just like, God, yeah. man. In total, how many casualties did your company take? I mean, KIA was three, but whew, casualties. I, know, was, I think uh, the purple heart rate for the company it was like over fifty five percent, something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, nuts. Had received a purple heart. And then those sent home was another, there's quite a bit. I, I don't, couldn't even keep up. Yeah. At one point, Walter Reed, the entire prosthetics ward was our guys. Yeah. That's Nuts. crazy. Nuts. How was it when you guys started prepping to get out? Because I'm assuming you guys probably, everybody linked up kind of back in Kandahar, maybe, or there probably was at least some level of getting people back together so they could redeploy. So we actually... You know, I mean, you're doing your side by sides. Mm-hmm. Your other company came out. The left seat, right seat stuff, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we're supposed to be showing these other guys the AO or the area of operations, mm-hmm. and there wasn't there wasn't too many of those patrols. <laughs> you know, it was a lot more of explaining to them what was happening out there. I know on one of them, um, task force had a hit during it, and you know, it was just the lack of communication was another problem. You know, I'm seeing this A10 up ahead. And I'm like, hey, Sergeant Hill, uh, they know we're out here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I call forward anyway, call over to the company. Hey, does anybody, like, has anybody touched base with battalion? Like, oh, let's let's just check. Yeah, they said they they know you're out there. Okay. And then this thing goes into a dive. I'm like, yo, hey, Sergeant Hill, hey, hit the dirt. And, like, that's JDAM dropped 500 meters away. You know, we're seeing the freaking clods from from the gun going off. In the next orchard over and we're just like holy shit like let's get out of here we're done <laughs> you know let the rangers take care of it yeah you know if there's no crosstalk and there's no that gets very dangerous yeah yeah you know and this happened a few times i mean we had guys up on the op we had french mirages almost almost take them down <laughs> they're not gonna drop it's fine <laughs> <laughs> it's tough to get the uh i'm sorry but it's tough to get the french to drop ordinance <laughs> op is an observation point <laughs> <laughs> so how was your how was your rip out how were i mean how were the guys I mean, he was bit? just happy to be out of there yeah you know i mean really we had an instance in in kandahar 
to, I remember specifically, I was at the little NWR there myself, and we always went with somebody else. Morale, welfare, and recreation. Yeah. Just a, <laughs> a big gaggle of people sitting in this yeah. in this tent. You know, what would you describe an NWR tent as? It's like a, com- a community space where there's shit you can do. Yeah. Kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, it's not. I mean, TVs, it, it, some uh, computers, depending on where yeah, you're computers, at. It's, it's internet a, drops. Yeah. yeah. At the time when it was. A lounge. It was, it was, a, it was yeah. a lounge in order to get away from, you know, where people were doling out duties or like, hey, they need some guys over here. Or, hey, yeah. we just had some guys. We're pulling tower guard for them, too. Like, you could just hide out. Yeah. And the air raid sirens go off, you know, hey, rocket attack, because they would always shoot those rockets off the back end of Kandahar. And... I remember having my headphones in and everybody starts hitting the deck and I look around I take my headphones out and the guy under the table is like, dude, you got to get down, man. They're freaking rocketing us. And I just laughed at him. I'm like, dude, if it's my time to go. It's my time to go. You know, I walked out of there <laughs> like, can let's go, man. They're going to want us back and, you know, make sure for accountability. Probably time for you to head home at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't care. <laughs> you know, it just was. It was just like, if I'm going to go, It's a good metric go. for maybe you should uh, get the fuck out of the country. <laughs> yeah. 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 How about when you guys got back? What, is it, what does it look like mm. in the Army when you guys get back? Is there – does everybody go to the winds and then you bring in new leadership and then the unit or um, company or – I'm not great at Army terms, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But like at a SEAL team, we come back and basically most of the leadership – leaves Mm -hmm. because they're on to their next fill in the blank like the a platoon commander might be looking at operations officer like you're going to look for that next step up the ladder yeah a lot of the enlisted people will stay and do internal in the operational elements they'll take like a step up you know like there's a lpo or a leading petty officer probably similar to a first sergeant or something along those lines like a step underneath the senior leadership but he's managing the guys so whoever that was is probably up for chief or e7 at that point and so Maybe they get picked up and they're going to go somewhere. So, you know I mean, like most of the guys, though, kind of stay. The leadership definitely is going to is going to wipe and go somewhere else for their career progression. What's it look like for you guys when you get back? I mean, it eventually switches over. I know that normally you'll go into a you'll get some block leave and stuff to kind of decompress and everything. But I remember specifically we were not like it was like these guys are not going anywhere for I think it was like a month or so. Right. We had a weekend and that was it because yeah, we were we back were, for about a month. Yeah. We were flagged. And I mean, uh, also, I, I I also remember it coming back and we already knew that we were uh, going right back to the same place. Uh, they already you know, knew we, we the already next had, rotation you were going to yeah, go back. Yeah, we already had orders cut uh, to go right back. How much know? time in between? Uh, about, what, a year dwell time, I think it was. About it was a year. It was about a year, year and a half, though, because like, you half. guys ended yeah, up. We got back in August and left again in yeah. February of 12. Yeah. And I felt bad because that's when I went to selection and I was like, all right, well, I'm going that way. you know. Yeah. But then when I saw you, I, you guys came in at Green Ramp and I was like, man. Like, I think I that was just the longest felt... period of dwell time I'd seen at that point. Like, I've yeah. been in. Like, yeah, it was just churning. And stuff, yeah. yeah. Churning, churning, churning. Um, during that month time, though, when we were back, this was the this was the most striking thing. Is that we show up after this weekend, you know, and they were trying to make it. I mean, I could read the read the stuff. They were like, "All right, let's put these guys back into their routine, so they're just not buck wild when you get back." What did you mean? You guys were flagged. Mm, that goes into a VA flag. Yeah, like this unit was, hey, high risk. Unit. Veteran affairs flag. Uh, later on down the road. Okay. Later on down the road, um, they knew it was a high risk unit. Uh, they knew there was going to be issues, mm-hmm. and I mean, this is what I'm going into with. This is, I mean, we literally we show up for formation, for PT formation in the morning. And no one had told us that at Fort Bragg, they started a new thing where they shoot a cannon off in the morning to Mark Reveille. And it's inconvenient. Oh, I know, right? It's very disturbing. So here's a bunch of guys that, that were trying to get <laughs> walking through minefields too, that yeah. don't like booms. And they're all dress right dress, you know, looking good. And uh, everybody's ready for Reveille to go off, standing in a position of attention, and boom. The entire company hit the dirt. I mean, including first sergeant. This is what seventy-two hours after being home, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. And you know, he gets up with that nervous laugh, you know, and he's just like, "Well, <laughs> PTSD much?" You know, and it was just like that's sign number one. I don't even know if that's PTSD. I think that's just your brain cannot process leaving that environment as quickly as your body can. You can put your body on an airplane and like travel across space and time, for lack of a better term. <laughs> it takes a while for your head to get there. I, I actually think 
That's pretty natural reaction within like 72 hours of leaving Afghanistan. 72 days, different story. Seven months, two days, different story. Seven years, different story. Yeah, it would have been nice to have the heads up, though. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'm not saying what they did was awesome. <laughs> I think what I'm saying is I think it's an actually a pretty natural reaction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was... We had one point... It was really when we were over there when I noticed that the livestock, I think we were, um, they were blowing off an IED. Mm -hmm. EOD was out doing a BIP, which is a blowing place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, when, so for people listen, when they find an IED, it's not like you leave it out there, but you have to deal with it. Yeah. So a lot of times you blow them with other explosive. So we're waiting behind a wall and they're getting ready to hit the shock cord and they do. And the boom goes off and there's a cow like grazing. The thing didn't even flinch. Because yeah. it was just that normal for something in that area. Yeah, things go boom all the time. It's like, damn. Yeah. Also, cows aren't that smart. Yeah. You know. <laughs> this, is, this is true. So, this is true. <laughs> I mean, you know, let's, hopefully humans can process a little better. All right, so you're back at that formation. How's it go after that? I mean, that's that's where you have either – I mean, a lot of guys – either left you know they were they were done they're done with the military they're like that's it like after that uh, i don't think anybody had come back from that and said that that was i mean there's seasoned guys that were just like i've been through deployment after deployment i've never been through something like that that was hell yeah you know so a lot of them were just i'm out i'm done my time here is finished i never really stopped myself i never really stopped like that was the uh my goal was always to go back towards the SF side, go yeah. to the Q course. Did you end up following that path? I did to a point. Yeah. That was, um, I mean, I made, made it through SFAS mm -hmm. uh, after the Argonaut. That was easy. Um, that was not a challenge. And then signed into the Q course, started that process up, went through language school, got assigned Russian. Um, Grazwitzen. <laughs> I'm assuming you're just talking shit now. <laughs> we, we just were saying, like, if we ever are found without our cocks, just let us die. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> but it went that route. Um, I ended up, you know, some of that was, I guess, ultimately, I got dropped from the course on my own accord. You know, it's really... You know, I wasn't... What do you mean you got dropped from the course on your own accord? Did you quit? No. Hell no. All right, I'm just saying. No, no, no. Not in a million years. Yeah. No, I would have never quit. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hanging around the people I was hanging around with. Yep. Doing the stuff I was doing, I wasn't focused enough. Like, going, looking back on that, and like, the that's curriculum the curriculum weeded you out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, eventually, like, it was just, um, I wasn't doing the right stuff. You know, I wasn't focused enough. Fair. And I see that now, you know, um, which is really all you can do. You yeah. Know? I mean, not everybody, most people don't make it through the first time. Um, I mean, one of the most courageous SEALs I've ever heard of, Mike Monsoor, fucking jumped on a grenade. Quit buds the first time. You can go back. There are guys yeah. that have been back two or three times. Like, yeah. And, it, it, you know, if you get to the team, I honestly cannot remember conversations about Hey man, did, how many times did it take you to go through buds? People are just like, what's that doesn't up? matter. Yeah, you, no, you're like, there. Who yeah. gives a fuck? Yeah. I mean, that kid, it literally sacrificed his life to save the people that were there with him. And, you know, there would be people like, oh, couldn't make it through Buds the first time. <laughs> Quitter. Like, that motherfucker has a Medal of Honor. Right? Shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's always, you're always going to have someone who hates, you know? Well, and a lot of those courses, I mean, those courses, I, I, I can only speak about Buds. Buds is designed oh, yeah. to find what's going to fuck with you. You can come there as strong as you want physically. It's like, oh, mental challenges. Mm -hmm. We got you. You come. I mean, I guess it would be tough to get there not physically prepared because you have to take so many stupid tests along the way to actually yeah. get there. Yeah. But you could you could show up there maybe like on the lower end of the bell curve of ability, and uh, it'd be super mentally tough. It's like, all right, you're going to get a physical challenge. I mean, we had rock star D1 athletes, people who probably could have gone pro. Oh, yeah. Like, great runners. Yeah, they quit usually on the swims because they're so used to being such a good runner. Like, they cannot deal with yep. the mentality or emotionality of 
not performing at that high level on a swim or like yeah. collegiate water polo player can't run to save his life. Like, dude, how the fuck quits on the Monday morning four mile time run? Like <laughs> it's four miles. Yeah. And you do this every Monday. It's like, okay. And you, it's like, it's a mental thing. I mean, SFAS has a lot of the same type of challenges to where like 400 some odd people yeah. show up, but only, you know, maybe 100 make it through. I think my class was 97. There's an aspect of it where you have to be ready in your personal life too. Like yeah. there's mental toughness, physical toughness. And then also, are you at a phase in your life where you're ready for this shit? Yeah. And that's why they let people come back. Yep. <laughs> it's not, yeah. it doesn't have to be life ending. Unless you lose your cock. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> is that the entire, uh, that's the entire gist of this thing? That's actually, Michael, make a note, cleared hot bumper sticker. If and when you lose your cock, lose all hope. <laughs> that's the first draft. There's always RoboCock. <laughs> yeah. That actually is that the is bumper fantastic. sticker. That's fantastic. That's a shirt. That's brilliant. With that's a shirt. The microphone swing arm, because it can only be one size. <laughs> <laughs> and one color. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh man. Why'd you decide to write the book? This thing was really you know, this other book came out that had to do with this deployment. Uh it was actually it was off of we were talking before that Operation Resiliency get that got a lot of those guys from that particular deployment back in one place. Mm. You know, Charlotte, North Carolina to provide that peer-to-peer -peer end of things to where guys are opening up. They had clinicians there. They also had a reporter there named Ben Kessling, and he was doing it. He was a correspondent with the VA. Um, you know, so, I mean, works for Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. writing stuff that based on that end. And since this was a pilot program and the people they had there and what they were doing in conjunction, um, he was writing an article about it, writes the article about it, book publisher sees it and is like, hey, we really like this. Would you consider writing a book? Started interviewing people. Uh, I know you were actually mm. a big part of that. I like that article that, uh, was it Was it Army Times that yeah, did it was that Army one? Yeah, Army Times, yeah. Yeah, the chapter was Fuck It. You know, and it was talking. That was the title? That was the title. Yeah. I would absolutely read that article. Yeah. Oh, it was good. It was, But it was talking about, and that's like where he really got into that day with Sergeant Brunkhorst. Mm -hmm. That's why it's not as detailed in mine. Number one, I cover it from the first platoon vantage. Yeah. So I thought it was really cool as well. You know, here's this guy out here putting our stuff out. Um, man, I mean, when I got a copy of it, like right before it published, uh, he sent me a copy to look it over. Um, I took it out of the mailbox and I, I started crying. I didn't even expect that response, but it was just that somebody was listening. Somebody gave a shit about the things because so many of us at that time, we were like, no one wants to hear about this. None of us really talked about it. Um, you know, so I was like, this is, this is great. But to some of the guys, it, it fell short and it didn't, you know, they're like, he wasn't there. It's, it's not the always going to fall short. Yeah. You could have a hundred people there. There's a mm -hmm. hundred different versions of that story and they're yep. all true. Because I it in the author's note. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I get it. It's I get perspective. Why. It is perspective and everybody has their own and these things impact people differently and yep. memories are encoded differently. Yep. It's a tough one to wrap your head around. Sometimes you're like, oh, this guy's full of shit. It's like, yeah. actually, he's doing the best of his ability to tell the truth. And that's where I've met a bunch of this in there. And that's where it was so cool was taking the concerns that the guys had about the other book. Hey, he wasn't there. Okay, fine. Then one of us that was there has to write it. Who's going to do it? Nobody else is stepping up. All right. I guess it's me. Um, And then starting to hit those points. Okay, what are they upset about? And some of it was just that they wanted accuracy. And I'm like, this guy is a pro like professional reporter, and here I am. So, I mean, I immediately, I actually reached out to him in the beginning of it. I'm like, you heard my end of the story. You know, I had interviewed with him. I show up in his book at one point, and I think really only because of the actions on for Johnston. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, absolutely, like, write it down. He was more than encouraging. He's like, I want, this is why I wrote this, is to encourage other people to do things differently to step up to do to go forward and, and do something better than themselves uh i ended up putting it down but through that process the more that i got other people involved the it was almost like it was exponential you know like this this cover picture that's from we were talking before 
same town, Diakashe, where that suicide bomber was, mm -hmm. they lit off a thousand pound vehicle bomb and it flattened the compound the guys were in. Guys buried alive. Yeah, screaming full jingle under. truck full of HME that just, yeah, flattened that whole compound. It was a, uh, we were yeah. just off site, looked like a mushroom cloud. I mean, it was like everybody is dead there. Yep. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. And during this, you know, that's where that picture's from. Somebody snapped it as they're pulling the flag out after they had kind of uh, pulled everybody out and they're starting to recover everything in there. They saw the flag in the rubble and they're like, they decided, you know, this, uh, this doesn't sit right. And they flew that side. They pulled it out of the rubble and flew it back over there. Hey, we're here. Yeah. You can't stop us. And that really, I thought, embodied, even though it wasn't our platoon that was hit for that one, um, it really embodied the feeling there. You know, that really, that resilience and that you're not going to, you, you can knock us down, but we're going to get back up and we're going to get after it. And through that, and once that cover picture showed up, that's when, you know, I started getting other guys. Uh, Brian Erickson reached out to me and he's like, Bill, I've got that flag. And I'm like, what do you mean you have that flag? I recovered it. I brought it back with us to the States. I have it. You know, and to have somebody handing that over to you in tears, but saying, if you can use this to further this project, that's big. And that's heavy. That's a heavy burden on my end, too, is like, I got to get this right. What did you do with the flight? So that's, that's where this thing really just exponentially got better. We tried reaching out to the unit to like maybe get it in their historical, you know, their display case or something. Couldn't get in touch with them. But I remember we had a ceremony at the uh, Airborne and Special Operations Museum down in Fayetteville. And there's a paver out front with the guys that we lost over there. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like home. So I call. Unheard of. The, the curator picks up. That never happens. And I'm like, okay, I got 30 seconds. You know, let's give him the elevator pitch. And after 30 seconds, I noticed he's still listening. And I'm like, hey, you, uh, so you don't understand. Like, I've been waiting for this call. And it just snowballed. It snowballed. So that flag is actually down. It got entered into the DOD historical archives for perpetuity. You know, these, these guys can bring their kids down there and go, you know, and their grandkids and their great caring kids. And this is literally a piece of history now. You know, this is Ben DOD approved. You know, there's, we were talking before about the suicide bomber with uh, Sergeant Lee and that PMAG. That PMAG is on display there. But all this stuff, and there's more stuff that's filtering in. You know, there's more stories through there and more pieces from that that are getting put together at this museum. That's really, I mean, it's special. It's amazing. It's crazy. It's history that I hope that we never lose. Same. What do you want people to get out of the book? Like, what, what do you hope that the reader pulls out of it? Which is, I mean, super broad question, obviously, because some people would read it for historical value. Some people would read it for entertainment. But as the author, what do you hope people get out of it? I mean, originally it was getting our guy's story out there. That was the most important thing to me was getting the most accurate picture of what these guys did in that slice of history and making sure that that was put down in record for perpetuity. But then, like, as I started analyzing more and more what, what's been done there and, like, how it was done. So I wrote it at kind of a high school level. So it's an easy read. But if you start looking at what the enlisted in the military and stuff goes to, they really, their education for the most part stops after high school. Generally, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them, you know, the rates of guys going forward for the GI Bill, it's abysmal. You know, it's, use these benefits. You don't have to use it for traditional education. I mean, I did, but I also used that as a buffer to figure out, you know, I did business school in two and a half years and then went forward and even used it further for Columbia Business School. Yeah. You know, and, but you can use this for, you know, flight school. You can use it for so many different avenues in your life and I don't understand why they don't. So, I mean, I, I literally end this on a call to action for those guys. Get involved in your communities. You know, you, we were talking about this on the way over here. You know, you know what right leadership looks like at one point or another in your career. Yeah. Take those lessons integrate them into your life, you know, use that stuff to bolster your community, get involved. I mean, like, look at a lot of the dads and stuff out there. Just look around you. The people that step up you know, are far and few in between, but the more that you do and the more that you actually do this stuff, you're going to inspire others. 
And that's that catalyst that I hope happens. I hope other people get to do better things. I mean, that's the whole reason why I brought Nick down here is some of the stuff that he's doing. Is I'm like, I want to support you in that end, and I want to support other guys that are bringing this stuff forward and, and trying to be a positive effect within their communities. And it sounds like you're doing a lot of that same thing. I, I mean, I don't know how much of an impact or an effect I'm having. I try to tell the truth. I try to have conversations like this at a level that, I mean, you know, again, we had a 10 minute conversation about whether or not you would want to live with your dick or not. <laughs> but, but that's a real fucking conversation that people probably never have. And that is a very honest and true snapshot into the world that we lived in. Yeah. You know, and the dark humor end of things. 100%. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, where else are you going to get exposed to that different optic or lens on life? I love that scene in Jarhead where, uh, was it Jamie Foxx? They're walking through the oil fields with the stuff burning in the background. God, it's been a piece since I've seen Jarhead. Oh, it's such a good movie, though, in the way of, like, from that aspect and stuff. And he's out there, and he's like, where else Where else are you going to experience something like this? Yeah. What are your guys' thoughts on your time in Afghanistan now that it's been in the rearview mirror for a bit? What do you think about your service and the time that you spent over there and everything that came with it? Yeah, I think we— uh it was all for a reason, you know, at, at some point, whether that reason was above us or anything else, you know, we were just talking about it the other night. It's like, you know, if anybody were to ask me as a, um, you know, when I was a, a PFC or a private there or, uh, you know, even some of the other levels, you know, it's like, what is the, the overall reason you're here? I don't necessarily know because it seems like we're just, you know, we're, we're here for a year, then we're gone for a year, then we're here for a year. It's just yeah. a deployment rotation and a deployment schedule. But you know what? Uh, being on the ground and seeing some of the things we did from, you know, stabilizing certain regions and stabilizing certain areas to, uh, you know, even the, uh, the, the level of, you know, schoolwork building and, and, and infrastructure building in these local areas. And with the way everything turned out and the way everything goes and, you know, the way the withdrawal went and everything like that, you know, a lot of people run into that kind of the, you know, it was all for nothing. It was all for nothing. And, and to that regard, you know what, there, there's a piece of that that is correct, but you know, there's, there's other pieces in looking at the positive and the negative and, and you know what, if, if we could have influenced several people or, you know, made several people's or even just one person's life better over there, you know, then it's all worth it in that regard, you know? Um, if and we, I can answer that one because of like what I was telling you where the, the reach of this thing went. So I literally posted up, um, I ran a bunch of stuff on, you know, now we're running Reddit boards too. But I posted up a picture of one of the villages, Pirpamal, that we were in. It was at the base of the mountain, and we would do a uh, what we it was called a lock patrol, which was a line of communication. We had to keep mm -hmm. this open from IED, so we just constantly patrolled this thing. But there was these kids that would always come out of the villages while we're going through there. Well, I post this picture up on there, and this guy comes back, and he's like, "Hey, that's my hometown village." Uh huh. And I'm like, oh, no way. I, I DM'd him. And I'm like, what years? He said, well, my family left in 2012. You know, we left and I'm in New York City now. I'm like, huh. I'm like, well, I was there in 10. What do you remember? He knew exactly who we were. And he was like, we loved you guys. Comparatively to the people that were there before and what was going on and everything, mm -hmm. they were like, you guys. You know, and that right there, to hear that from someone who was there, that's powerful. And then to go even further, I mean, with this whole project, the reach of things that we have these days, I've been getting like Afghan refugees reach out to where so much to the point to where I've put bots in there uh, to be like, hey, these are organizations that deal with vetting people and getting people out of the area. I've gotten stuff with, you know, interpreter credentials sent out to me. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm in Europe. Hey, I'm in Pakistan with my family. They're about to deport us back to here. Can you help? I can't help in any other way of passing along this information, but to have that power through the social media on here, you know, this is just a year long of daily putting pictures out there, but like, what are the possibilities there? You know, what else can be done? Um, you know, and you look at the, during the pullout of Afghanistan, Digital Dunkirk, there's a bunch of civilians, really, that put together a network that was like rivaling, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's just people ingrained in there that's that's helping people get through chaos we like to call it a withdrawal you know the pullout again i'm going back to the uh, hot tub <laughs> oh, no. with you it's weird some of the words that we choose and the things that they mean <laughs> i'm still learning <laughs> <laughs> never never 
<laughs> Nick, tell me what you got, what you're doing now. So I am the Veterans Programs Director at a uh, veterans nonprofit, the Independence Fund. Um, I get the opportunity to work with a, a great team on a myriad of pro- projects, and you know it's been it's been awesome because it's full circle for myself being back within the veteran community. You know, I got out, had a myriad of just diff- kind of different jobs and different directions that I went when I went out, and. You know, it's been it's been cathartic for me to be back in this area. So um, within those programs, we have you know um, mobility and uh, adaptive sports, and where we give out track chairs and try to give you know veterans who are wounded, uh, disabled, uh, wounded, ill, injured, you know that sense of independence, being able to get mm-hmm. where regular wheelchairs you know fail or hit their end, and get them back out. But we also try well, to these provide, things are badass. Yeah, we, like track chairs. Really they're, cool. Yeah, they're awesome. So, you know, with that, it comes kind of that whole wraparound support, you know, because it's not just like one aspect, you know, now that you can get out there, what can we help you do you do for you as well? So some aspects, you know, a lot of these guys there, you know, whether they were competitive shooters, they enjoy fishing, hunting and everything like that. We have programs designed to, and tailored around that and getting them back engaged in the outdoors and out of that dark space, you know, uh, per se. Um, we have a caregiver program, family programs uh, for those heroes kind of behind the scenes helping the, uh, the veterans that were wounded and, and ill and injured and, you know, stabilizing that family aspect. Um, we have uh, Operation Resiliency, which is our suicide prevention program like, you yeah, know, yesterday. That's what we were talking about earlier. About. And so um, that kind of came about. Uh, at actually one of our guys' funerals who had died by suicide yeah. and uh, uh, Derek Hill. So he was he was actually one of my team leaders. And I've known him for pretty much my entire Army career. We were in a different unit together. And then we had had a permanent change of station and um, to Fort Bragg uh, where we got with the 82nd Airborne Division and, and continued our relationship there, you know, working alongside each other. Um, so at that point, you know... Um, some of the people in the audience it just became some of that dark humor of you know you know that seemed like these were the only places we were kind of getting together and they said you know see you at the next one um so that kind of sparked um our ceo sarah verardo who you know was tired of hearing kind of that level you know come from us and or that level of talk come from us so she decided to do something about it and incorporated the uh, or started up the program Operation Resiliency with Dr. Keita Franklin, who worked at the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention for for VA, and they came out with this kind of, came up with this kind of out of the box like innovative solution to trying to um, you know curb veteran suicide and, and prevent it. And so with that, we bring back these uh, combat units that are you know generally flagged like like our unit, like you're saying. So our our unit is flagged by VA as being a high risk unit just due to the amount of uh guys we lost the purple heart rate and like the suicide rate amongst our units since we've been back Mm -hmm. um so we we go through these units and take the you know these units back that had uh suffered high casualties overseas or had you know very very intense deployment and since come back and have suffered the epidemic of suicide amongst their ranks and bring them back in and kind of charge them with being their brother's keeper. You know, we put the command team in charge and, you know, break them up into their 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 elements that they were in before everybody scattered, you know, to the to the four winds. In in our case, it was 10 years yeah. later now at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, as our deployment was 2009, 2010. We got together in April of 2019. And like you had asked, you know, what's – what's it look like when everybody comes back uh you know everybody kind of scatters to the four winds some people rise to different levels of leadership uh but for the most part you don't really unpack any of that stuff you just keep to the grind stay in the meat Mm -hmm. grinder um because you have to you know you got to be accountable to yourself you got to be accountable to your guys and all that but you know you never really get to process that so you know i know i didn't personally you know when i had gotten out and had my own ups and downs when I got out that I had to work on. So, you know, getting back together with some of these guys 10 years removed, was it was a great thing. And, you know, so now at this point we've done 13 Operation Resiliency retreats uh, to date. Oof. And so we um, bring them back in for, for a weekend. It's about four days. And through that four days there's uh, – there's team building and uh, group bonding and team building exercise to, you know, bring them back together, get that unit, you know, kind of peer to peer relationship going again to get them, you know, spark that 
spark that shit talking really you know of like getting them just re-engaged with each other and back to that you know kind of family you know we're, we're a big family we're all brothers you know we we have our relationship was forged in fire uh during deployments and you know we washed each other's backs there why wouldn't we do it back here so along with the team building and everything we have uh, a couple sessions where we do breakout sessions of group therapy uh, led by clinicians where we kind of unpack that bags and prompt people to unpack those bags and we leave it up to you know the guys too to decide how they want to unpack that bag amongst themselves you know because it's um you don't have to always have that person that has a similar shared experience but with this like kind of model it is that shared. you know he and i know exactly what we did um he and i have you know yeah, there's an here incident and talk i mean those same experiences and, and, well. and so it, it helps out you know and i think the biggest thing we leave with that weekend is is charged to be you know look out for your brothers be your brother's keeper pick up the phone you know re reinitiate that that sense of tribe that sense of peer-to-peer support you know and um has just, it impacted just, suicide numbers um on, on the in the grand scheme of thing um i don't think we've been able to reach out to enough yet you know um but at the same time i, I would say within within Bravo. within our ranks you know we've done very well um i think you know um in in staying in contact with each other you know it's when you're having a rough day i've noticed a lot more now that i've been in contact with with all you guys you know a lot more than i ever used to be and and for me it's cathartic and you know in its own right and um you know it's just you know it's my boys and so and and so we try to bring that to to all these other units who seem to be you know having a, a high level of success um with it as well and staying contact and staying interconnected and everything so uh we're coming up on our five-year reunion uh, again, after yeah. our first Operation Resiliency Retreat, so we're doing our 2.01 here coming up in uh, the end of June. And so that'll be a different little little bit of a model, but uh, it'll just be good to get back together, see all the guys again, and, and go from there. Do you guys think we can actually solve the veteran suicide problem? I actually think that starts, that starts from out processing. That's from like, that's where we lose a lot of them. That's in my opinion. What obligation do you guys think the military has when it comes to out processing people? And these are not questions that I have answers to, but these are things yeah. that I think about. Yeah, yeah. Like, is the military Same. even tooled, equipped, or capable of handling that? Or is that the role of some type of non government organization that steps in and fills that void? I don't think that is really number one I, I don't think that's the military's job and it shouldn't completely be i think that that to is, land on that uh, opinion as well but it's the handoff they do horribly there was actually one instance what are you talking about? i went to at least one hour of the taps program <laughs> yeah it, and that's like that's <laughs> i literally told him the other night that is where i almost want to head next after here i wrote a book five years ago before this but i'm like nobody's gonna listen who's yesky who is this guy and now with this i'm like this is why that book was written. So my last eight months in the army, I ended up back in the 82nd, back in conventional, Ugh, terrible. And I ended up in this unit that I was on rear D, they made me a platoon sergeant right away. And there's this kid there, he was getting ready to out process. So normally those guys are pretty freaking happy. This dude was not that way, something was not right. He wasn't my guy, but it just took me coming by one day where he was on um, staff duty. And I looked at him and I'm like, hey, man, no one else is here. Like, what's going on with you? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm like, you're not good, man. Like, come back to my office. No one is here. It's all good. And we start talking. And he had two weeks left. And I asked him where he was in that process. You know, I, where's your, you know, you're supposed to have brag. You're supposed to have so many stamps or whatever. You go through whatever station, check these boxes, right? You know, everybody hates that end of things. 96 it's, box line item yeah. checklist eggs at the military. And, and maybe the best thing they do out of is the freaking resume class, which is it, yeah. you know? Um, he hadn't done a damn thing. And that checks out. He broke out, you know, I mean, he breaks down and he's like, I'm literally, I'm, I've, I'm going to kill myself. And I was like, do you mean you're going to kill yourself or do you mean like you're actually thinking about killing yourself? And he's like, no, I, I don't know what the next step is. Like I am in I, his life. He meant post military. He, he was literally ready to, to off himself. Why? 
Because he didn't know what to do with his life. He was, yeah, he was being so he was being outprocessed. He um, he got busted down in rank, mm -hmm. which at that point uh, he was in that window to where it was, you know, automatic. Bye bye. See you later. And he just didn't have a plan. He mm -hmm. didn't have any plan going forward. Uh, and what he didn't realize was that you know they still owed him the rest of the contract anyway. I'm like, dude, you, you know, in uncovering everything and in basically asking him what was wrong, finding that disconnect, finding that he was looking at that route instead of you know larger picture. You know, and he had a family too. You know, and then when I took it to first sergeant, and I was like, I mean, I asked him right off the bat. I'm like, look, man, like. If you're going to kill yourself, you're, you're going to end up doing it. But will you, if we try to work you through this, will you hang in there? You know, and it was, uh, I got a yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, well, let's go bring this to the first sergeant, you know, hang back. And I did. And he literally just complete wrong answer, piece of garbage, looks at me and he goes, get that kid out of here as fast as possible. He's now yours. He just didn't want him on his books. Yeah. Which I immediately went back to my office and I said, all right, bud. We're going to see Sergeant Major, you know, and I walked him in down there and we got him down to the mental health clinic and I got him a clinician and we started working through this stuff. And then through this, I kind of uncovered that, like, you know, I was, I'm, I've always been really good at paperwork <laughs> and going up to there and knowing the people that I knew through there and talking with them, finding out this kid was owed like $70,000 from the military, you know, as pay forward for his contract or it was breach of contract how old was he maybe 22 okay young young yeah and uh you know i mean we were you know just think if i hadn't have asked yeah you know and that's literally just man what a wild headspace to arrive at i mean nothing in life is permanent unless you make it permanent yeah which you need time to understand and at 22 the concept of time is like pfft. Tomorrow is all there's ever been yeah. and all there will ever be. <laughs> like, you can do some of the dumbest shit ever. Like, Oh, no, I, I had my own. I talk about it in yeah. here. I had my own spots to where, you know, I was going through a rough patch. And I just I it wasn't that I ever thought about uh, going that route, but it was that I didn't care. And I was living wild enough to where I didn't really care about the consequences of what was happening around me. And I found myself going like 100 plus miles an hour down these back roads in North Carolina and it finally took some kid trying to follow my line and blowing off into the woods at 100 plus and then me pulling him out of that vehicle and realizing that my actions were having consequences affecting other people. Yeah. You know, I almost got somebody killed. I mean, if he didn't have a roll cage in his car, that he would have been that would have been a really bad scene. I mean, I can understand being call it 22 for an estimate and the military is what's higher. Yeah. yeah. Well, the military is what you've known for probably four years at that point. You know, maybe you just really, whatever it may be, right? So yeah. you joined at 18 and you're thinking that the world is crashing down around you. And what am I going to do next? And I don't know what to do. And it's like, that's okay. Yep. It's like that's going to happen in your life. I've been so many times <laughs> in my life where time after time, you just, you step up and you look at the abyss and it's like, I don't know what's going to be next. Or you get, encounter a problem. Yeah. I don't know how to solve this. But all problems have solutions. Yeah. Unless you quit. You know, yeah. e like every situation you have in your life has has an outcome. And it may not be the outcome that you want, but that outcome might lead you to opportunities which could lead you back around to other outcomes. Unless you make these choices that are just absolutely concrete. You know, you just can't come back from some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we can solve the veteran suicide problem. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people I think feel like that veterans are killing themselves because of what they were exposed to in the military. And I think some of that might be true. There's a lack of purpose. Well, there's also a chance that if they were predisposed to that, it was, had nothing to do with their military service. Mm. What did they bring into the service with them? Oh yeah. You know, like not everything can be blamed on our experiences overseas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I know. I, I'm working with some of that stuff right now, like with therapists and stuff. I personally think yeah. it made me a better version of myself. Like for one thing I know for absolute certain for me is I have a better understanding and ability to love because of the experiences that I had overseas. Probably because I have a wider optic on like how 
fucking horrendously bad it can get. Right. And have seen things like the Chai Boys. Yeah. Or even galactically worse than that of, the, of how humans can treat each other. And, I, and I'm not saying that they can't break people or damage people, but, you know, I, I was the beneficiary of winning the lottery with my parents, for sure. I got lucky in that respect. And a lot of people aren't in that place. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you're, God, I don't know how to describe it other than saying if you're a broken person, and I don't mean that with any negative connotation. If you are a broken person before military service, it's unlikely, I think, absent intervention that the military is going to fix you. So you could exit it broken as well, too. Yeah. Well, how compound much, it even more so. <laughs> compound it even more so, yeah. potentially. So, And then how much of the burden should be borne by the military for that? How yeah. much of the burden should be borne on the... I mean, I don't have answers to any of these things, yep. but this is the stuff that I think about. Yeah. No, and you're not... I mean, you're not wrong. I know some of the ideas that I've had with what we were saying with the TAPS program is um, giving people these ways forward, things to think about and everything, but what you're saying, absolutely right. Like, if it's falling on deaf ears or if they're pre to yeah. go down that other route... Who's to say that's going to do any good, you know? Yeah. And to truly solve the suicide issue inside of the military, we'd have to solve the suicide issue with outside too. humans, yeah. which I don't think that's possible. We're a wild bunch. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, we might be able to lower the average <laughs> to be a little bit more in line with like, say, the st uh, civilian statistical likelihood of, of suicide, but it's never going to go to zero. It just won't. Hmm. And I don't think we should try to not we shouldn't give up because of that we should try to get it to zero but obviously realize human beings are a mixed bag i worked with some wild fuckers okay. <laughs> definitely yeah. have avenues for intervention and make it preventable yeah. but but ultimately yeah like you said i mean it's, i don't it's, think it's possible to actually stop it i think we could at best hope to get it more down towards the civilian average but even then like god damn man what a choice what a fucking choice man I mean, yeah. If you don't have a cock, I understand it. But <laughs> <Go up to Canada. laughs> I know that on the, on that end, you know, that's something I don't think that I'd ever, you know, and again, you know, this is just talking, but, you know, I don't think that's a choice I would ever make on that end. I could be some pretty low places. Yeah. But I, I, I think I do believe that some people are more uh, predisposed to it than others. Yeah. For me, I don't know if I would ever even consider that a rational decision, but yeah. it's it's not a rational decision. People are in a place of being irrational where they convince themselves it's the only logical or rational option. And, and I, I think that's part of the part of being mindful of that. Like, am I having these type of thoughts? Like, is yeah. this sort of thing creeping up there? Um, or where, where am I at in my headspace? Yeah. Nick, how can people help your organization? Like, what do you guys need? Where can they find you? What do you need? Uh, biggest thing right now. I mean, so you can find us at www.independencefund.org. Um, on the website, you'll see everything that we offer and everything that we, you know, we do within the veteran space. Um, I try to keep it as transparent as possible. So, you know, just go online, check it out. Uh, obviously, you know, it being a nonprofit, we, you know, the bucket doesn't fill up and it's, we, we leave it up to, you know, generous donors and those, you know, that want to, that believe in what our mission to help us accomplish our mission. Um, so the biggest thing I could say is, you know, just just put the word out there, you know, referrals when it comes to Operation Resiliency, we're always looking for, you know, for units that, you know, that would be uh, qualified and meet the criteria to go through, you know, along the same lines as all, all the previous units. And, um, you know, if, if you're out there, if you need a, if you're a wounded veteran, sick veteran, ill veteran or, you know, you need something, look, look check us out and you know happy to help out and in what ways that we can and if we can't help you ourselves we'll point you in another direction of somebody that can help you you know at least that's one of the biggest thing about you know the veteran space is that a lot of times it seems very cutthroat and uh you know i, I don't think mostly it because be like it that. is yeah it is yeah, yeah. and there, there's like overlap to where oh, there's like fucking wild. knives out there yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, i wait for you to fail you know so i i think you know just pay it forward you know yeah. just just be a good human try to do the best the best you can for everybody and stuff you know there's definitely some shitheads that come through but you know and that's everybody everything. needs a little something that's in everything yeah. yeah you know there's always gonna be turds where can people find your book I mean, the really the essential link tree is damnthevalleybook.com. Okay. Uh, you have everything. From, How dare you make it so easy? Right. <laughs> I mean, oh, a, mar a marketing guy just made it simple. Like, well, yeah. I, I, but Amazon, 
Barnes and Noble. All the places you can get your books. All the places. The uh, audio book should be hitting around the time of this. Who did the voice? So, oh man. Please say James Earl Jones. God. I Damn actually it. put word out to Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, oh, I don't know. That, that would have been awesome. Hey, motherfuckers! <laughs> We're on patrol. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, somebody, Freeman, somebody yeah. asked, so I had to. I had to. Morgan Freeman would have been cool. No, it's just uh, God. I could listen to Morgan That'd Freeman. Cool. Read a, an ingredient list off the back of a fucking Diet Coke. I mean, he anything. Yeah, anything. He just it would be like gold. Same as James Earl Jones. Like, come on. It's like Darth Vader <laughs> is reading your shit. <laughs> no, they uh, Tantor Audio picked it up. So it's uh, Basil Sands is reading it. Um, I think I read the author's note. I told him I'd read it for free, but uh, yeah, you know. I don't think I have a face there are, or voice for radio. There's so people not. who are damn good at that shit. There is. I've heard horror stories of uh, doing the audio version. I don't think I could read this. And one more time. And one more time. Yeah. And one more time with more inflection. I would just be like, I'm going to go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, are either of you guys on the absolute dumpster fire known as social media? Oh. <sighs> It's, I mean, it's necessary these days for something like this. It's yeah. all at Damn the Valley Book. Uh, okay. I've been posting daily for a year. Um, yeah, almost a year. Come February, it's going to be a full year's time. And those are all pictures from the battlefield that these guys sent in. I had maybe five grainy Facebook pictures, Yeah, you know, when they asked. And I was like, you know, that's when the publisher said, do you have pictures? We need at least 30. I just said yes, because I knew that they would yeah, you'll find up. It. They'll find their way to you. Yeah. Nick, where can you be found? Uh, same thing. Uh, Independence Fund. You can find it all over uh, Instagram, Facebook, and... Oh, you're that. more than that. I was going to say. <laughs> did you notice that light I had illuminating his beautiful face went out? It Hold on. went out. I got one more question for you. We're going to need the light. Hold oh, on. Boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh oh Dun, dun, dun. Check this out. One is none and two is one. Boom. Look at that. Got to have the ambiance. It, well, it's Michael's job to charge them, and so it should surprise oh. nobody they're not charged. Look at that. Yeah. That's so why uh, can't have nice things. I know. <laughs> he knows the deal. What do you got on your right wrist? So right here is a memorial bracelet for a buddy of mine that I served with, uh, Specialist Joseph Karen. He, had, uh, he stepped on a mine coming over a wall and that same deployment we were just discussing on yeah. uh april 10th 2010 so i've had this for quite a while and i just continue to wear it in honor in his honor um you know i know a lot of guys take them off and choose not to but you know in some of my days you know it's always a good it's always a good check to accountability to have it on myself and you know look down and you know on, on the rougher days of you know what i do is for him and since he can't be here so i live a uh, you know, a life worth value since some of the guys that we we went there with weren't able to come back. So, you know, live a life for value for not just me, but for them as well. They're very common. Um, it's interesting to me how my own thoughts have shifted over time. Totally, pe I completely and utterly respect people's uh, desire to wear those for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. Mm. I wonder, is there a point in time where it's healthier to take it off than to wear it every day. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's an answer to that. Like if I, if it's I, per person, you it's know? per person. Yeah. Because they mean different things per people, per person, per people, per peoples, whatever, just to cover all three versions of the incorrect <laughs> usage of that word. <laughs> if I had died in, in the service of our country and people have asked me this before, well, you know, what would you have want people to do? And my answer is I would have want them to have lived the most fulfilled life humanly possible yep. because otherwise, what is the point? And I love those bracelets, yeah. but I often wonder sometimes if they anchor people to the past too much. Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely I, see that. Yeah. And, and, I'm not, and it's just, as you were talking, I was, I was looking at it and I was thinking about it. You'll never be able to forget that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll never be able to forget what they did, how they passed, the impact that they had on your life. But feeling that every day, at some point, does that become an actual anchor to the past? Whereas what I think those people would want is to you, for everybody to be able to put it down yeah. and move forward. And at the same time, though, is, I mean, so Specialist Johnson, mm -hmm. 
you know, day after Christmas. So around the holidays, this stuff comes up in the back, yeah, in the background. But I've had people come to me and go, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened to you. And I'm like, I'm not because that makes these holidays and stuff so much more yeah. special. Yeah. And as I'm looking around me and I'm saying like, this is, I'm getting to go forward and stuff and honoring them. Yeah. This is special. And don't get me wrong. Like I, yeah. I think those are so valuable, but I wonder if there reaches a point in time where it is less valuable to the person wearing it and actually becomes a potential stumbling block from a mental perspective of how they view just their place in the world. Yeah. And I don't have an answer to it. No, I mean, uh, it, what you're saying there as not being an anchor, but then also what you're saying and yeah. going forward. And I think yeah. both can be true, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. Like, there's no reason that both can't be true. It's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I could see the same thing, you know, because there, there's days where you look at it and then, uh, you know, or just happen to see it. Most of the time, I just forget that it's even there. And yeah. and honestly, it's just still here kind of because it hasn't broken. It's one of the few that I have that hasn't broken yet because yeah. uh, I had a few more as well. But, you know, there, there's definitely days where, you know, you look at it and then it, it is a whole wash of feelings that you're like, ah, I didn't really feel like dealing with that right now. Or it takes you not, not necessarily back to a, a bad place or anything like that, but it's a split second where it's like, you know, your whole life in 12 months just flash through your eyes in a split second and, and stuff. But, hmm. you know, I, I will say at this point now with where I'm personally at with everything, you know, I I think I'm in a good place with it, you know, with all, yeah. with a healthy place with it all, um, you know, but uh, I'm not going to lie. Checks you know, and going, going, through, in, going through that book and seeing some of those pictures and everything, you know, it, it, yeah. it definitely is a, is a flood of feelings and, you know, being there in the moment and, and, and checking back in. And I think in, in, in regards, it's healthy sometimes too to, to know where you came from and know what you did. And, you know, and. But you're not the only one with that type of thing. I mean, with these pictures and with these stories, I've had guys coming back, you know, saying that either they're getting cravings, you know, unhealthy stuff like, you know, I want to drink, I want to smoke, and I haven't in years. Um, from then and so what does that say as well it says you need to listen to what yeah your oftentimes invisible voice is trying to tell you yeah you have to deal with your shit before your shit deals with you and for me writing this was actually really good in that way because up until that point if you look at what i did after i got out of the service it was go 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 i mean business school in two and a half years yep. freaking ivy league after that uh all the things I was doing in between there as well, you know, with kids, with a wife in nursing school <laughs> and slowing down enough to write that in and then start processing it. There's chapters I wrote with tears just flowing down and stuff, but knowing you know, some of that, I don't even, uh, some of that's actually disappeared, like from my memory. Like I have to go back and reread this yeah. for some of it because it is, I downloaded some of it and my mind was like, okay, you're at peace with that now. Would you guys want other people wearing a bracelet with your name on it if you passed? I'd want it to be up to their choice, how they remembered me. Honestly. What do you think? I want a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, yeah, like you said, it's it's their choice. Um, I don't know. I couldn't make that call, you know? Uh, when I'm gone, I'm gone. I can... It's up to you what, what you want to yeah. do. You know how you want to, you know, either honor my memory, you know, I always hope whatever that you want to do. And, you know, that people would remember, like, on that end, you know, you always, like, want to say the, the good things and stuff, but that people would remember you just in the fact of that you were that dynamic of a person, that you had an Im impact on someone. It was uh, an event recently where they were, you know, talking about not necessarily mortality, but they were asking people some pretty pointed questions about the end, like, who would you want to carry your casket? Mm. Would you want to be cremated or, you know, buried? Which, from military, like, we have the answers to those questions because we were fucking not allowed to leave the room until we answered them <laughs> <laughs> right but a lot of people don't you're right yeah, you know, a lot of people don't an interesting that one reflection. that I, I feel like I probably have a different answer than a lot of people on was who would you want to come to your funeral mm. what would your guys answer to that be and then I'll tell you what mine is hmm. I don't know I've never really thought about it in that regard I was able to figure out what song I wanted played at my funeral but was as it far Metallica as it, Ride the Lightning no, it was uh, Jukebox Hero. <laughs> oh, my God. 100%. That was in my blue book. <laughs> what about you? I think for me, honestly, is it's a funeral is not about me. It's about the other people reflecting on how I affected them. The first I've heard this one. The first row of people at the funeral are those that you directly impacted. Mm. The second row of people are those that are there to support the first row, and everybody else is on their fucking phone. 
Dang, yeah, that's a uh, that's a pretty good rundown. <laughs> it's true. That's really, that's yeah, true. And, but yeah. I mean, like, really, with that being said, is uh, you know, I wouldn't want people there that like never really gave a shit, you know, yeah. or, or don't really care. Like, it'd be like I want that core that either I had an effect on or they're supporting each other. Like you're saying, you know, yeah. there's a reason why they're there. My answer is absolutely fucking nobody mm. because. If I touched your life in some way, mm. go do something with it. Don't waste your fucking time looking at, for me, I had the most fucked up shit in my, like, what happens to me if I die with the whole purpose of messing with my friends. Like, I'm going to be cremated and I need seven of you to summit Everest <laughs> and you're not allowed to have oxygen in the <laughs> hopes that they would die too. <laughs> I'm not joking. I wrote that shit down. And like, you will take... $100,000 of my SGLI life benefit and you will go drink it dry at a fucking bar. Uh, no one's allowed to leave till $100,000 is fuck. I, but these are those conversations we were talking about, those deployment conversations. You yeah. Know, the, the God, crazy. it's like, if yeah. I'm going out, fuck you guys. I'm going to mess with you guys too. But legitimately, I don't want a funeral. Hmm. If I touched your life and it meant something to you, go live the fullest life you possibly can. Yeah. And if you were going to go there because you felt like you had to be there and you were going to be in the back and be on your cell phone, don't, yeah, don't be there. Yeah, don't don't be there. Yeah. Go live your oh, life. That's a great answer. Yeah. I mean, and it's legitimately how I feel. And people are like, oh, that's weird. You don't want to have a celebration of life. And it's like you guys said, it's not for, it's not for me you. at yeah. that point. Yep. Or don't cremate me and halfway through I want a fucking springboard to launch up and I'll be like, ah, <laughs> like that's the shit that goes from, the thing, like yeah. launch me out of it. And I only have like a T-shirt on and fucking Robocock <laughs> is just fucking, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if we're going to do it, I want to traumatize motherfuckers. And the, like <laughs> these, it's like I need to have a robotic hand in there that's like knocking on the inside of the coffin at quiet times Messing in the people. service to people yeah. think I'm like trying to. Huh? Or like it pushes on a little bit, so like the little latch. People are like, "What the fuck is going on?" <laughs> Your so, dead corpse skydives. So in. these are my two choices: either that's what I want, or I don't want anybody there. Exactly. I don't know what that says about me. I'm just sharing my truth with you guys. Hey, well, I could appreciate it. that. You know, yeah. yeah. Michael's like walked out the door. He's like, "I'm never working for this person again." <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give you the most extravagant funeral ever organized, God. just to spite you. That would be. Well, I just have to make sure that my body's never found. Maybe. And then hopefully you would die in searching. <laughs> he's he's taking people it. down with him. <laughs> but it's legitimately how I feel. As the person was asking that question, hmm. for, you know what? And, it, and then, you know, the question, what would you want people to say at your funeral? Absolutely fucking nothing. Yeah. Absolutely That's nothing. That's all personal to each person, I think. Take whatever it is that you would want to say and just go live your life to the yeah. best you possibly can. Yep. I'm not going to hear it. So it now means more to you than it would have meant to me because I can't hear that. And just go do you. So that's where I land. I like On that it. fucking negative note, how do you guys want to wrap it up? I'll leave it with you two. Ah, bring us back to positive. Michael's over there like Googling the most effective way to kill himself. He's like, I can't take this conversation anymore. <laughs> Man, how do we end it? That, that's this is your show. No, it's your guys' show. Boof. I'm just the conduit. This show's about you. Hmm. Honestly, I mean, I I would just say is to give the message to other people. Go go live your life, man. Get out there and do something. Do do something to better not just for you. I mean, of course it's you're eventually gonna find something that's giving you purpose, that's rewarding and fulfilling in that way. Yeah. You know, but go find it. Stop being a freaking sit on the couch, do nothing. Sit on social media. I hate going on social media. It's my freaking job. I hate it. Um, because so many people get wrapped up in that end and they don't see the stuff around them. I see people with their, their nose in the phones or how they interact with their kids. Yeah. And it's like, you're here for a reason. You only get so many years with them too. You know, what are you going to impart? What are they going to bring forward? What are they going to say about dad? Yeah. Nick, bring us home. Oh boy! Well, on it's a that heavy note, burden, you know, buddy. Way to, way to, yeah, way to, way to one up me on that one. Thanks a <laughs> <Whoa>, lot. <laughs> whoa, you got to follow it. So good luck. No, <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, uh, what makes you happiest in life? 
crush my enemies. See Stop them. Stop it, Conan. Oh, oh, Shut the fuck up. I think, I think really is- To I crush touch, my I, enemies, see the enemy driven before me, and to jab steroids into my ass. Like, <laughs> come on. You were literally talking about this the other night. I mean, it's just the the, the purpose ingrained them with the yeah. stuff you're doing right now, and you want to be doing something yeah, I think, uh, to give back. The biggest thing, you know, find find a life worth living. Find a purpose in what you do, and find, find that tribe, whatever that tribe is, whether it's, you know, skydiving, whether it's scuba, whether it's fishing, whether it's, you know- Find your group. Meeting another group of dudes with RoboCops, who, cocks, who knows, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, technically, RoboCops probably would have RoboCops, so uh, I, got, uh, I, I was there with you. Um, but find that purpose, find that meaning, you know? Uh, get out of that hole, get out of that dark spot. It's not as easy as, you know, it sounds, but just the only way to do it is to fucking do it. Yeah. So get it out there, do great things, like- most of those veterans, you know, that we would speak to, you come from a long line and a long history of people that have made this country what it fucking is. That's something to be proud of, you know. Um, but go do things. Go do something special. Go do go do fantastic shit. Be something. Be the somebody. So That's good. I like it. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Did you sign the book? This one is. All right. You have to sign that one then, too. Everybody has to sign the book when they come in. Next time we come in, you better have a book. It can wow. be a coloring book. I'm not saying it has to. It can be a cookbook. Third, third platoon is probably a freaking workout book. Yeah, well. <laughs> Whatever it may be. <laughs> Until next time, gentlemen. Yes, sir.